and, and the other. Maybe, maybe when he walks in, we can all look at him and stare. He wants to enter on camera. Point. I think that's yeah. On the air. Dramatic. He's walking in. Oh, we're on air. Good evening. I'd like to call to order the Albany Revitalization Agency Committee meeting, Budget Committee meeting. Can we have a roll call, please? Collins? Here. Chrisman? Here. Pearson? Here. Keller? Here. Canopa? Here. Folden? Here. Olson? Here. Summers? Kellum? Here. Connolly? Here. Kopsinski? Here. Coburn? Johnson? Here. Thompson? Here. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the election of officers for this budget committee. One at a time, or all three. We can at once. do the slate either way. How about uh, I nominate the current office holders? Senator. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. All right. Motion carries. Then you have before you the minutes from May 14, 2013. Move for adoption of the minutes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> All right. Any business from the public? All right, then we're ready to proceed to the budget message. I'm going to scoot this over. I'm a little hoarse fighting the tail end of a cold here. So let's um, open this up. All right. Good evening, Chair Folden, Mayor, and Budget Committee members. I'm Kate Portia, and I'm honored to serve as your Urban Renewal and Economic Development Director for the City of Albany. And I'm going to be presenting tonight's budget message and overview of the ARA uh, budget for you. And I just wanted to point out and kind of direct you in the packet of information that you received. The narrative for the ARA budget is in this packet, and it begins on page one, aptly enough. And then you also receive the actual um, staff report and agenda packet and in there I had included some uh, detailed breakout of budget items those began on page one and I hope that those would maybe answer any specific questions you had I'll go over this at kind of a, a 5,000 foot level in the presentation and I'm not going to read the the budget um, presentation word by word but want to go over it and then if you have specific questions I'd be happy to answer those as well All right, so first, a little bit about me. I know we have some new uh, budget committee members, so real brief briefly, I had to, of course, put up a, an Oregon State Beaver logo just to partially chagrin the city manager and, and partially <laughs> promote the fact uh, that uh, I wanted to let you know that I uh, graduated from Oregon State. I have a degree in uh, my undergraduate from there and also my master's in public policy that I finished in 2012. Um, I'm also on a couple of boards throughout the state. One is the Oregon Economic Development Association, and I'm also president of the Oregon Redevelopment uh, Association group. And we are a, a group that specializes in best practices in urban renewal around the state. And the last photo I have up there is of my house, and that is sort of to let uh, you folks here and anybody watching at home know that um, I am not just committed to my role through my work, but I'm also personally committed. Um, you know, we live here in the community, and we're working to make our neighborhood and community a better place as well. So I want to sort of start off at the 5,000 foot level and talk just super briefly and let you know how CARA relates to the strategic plan. Um, this year I pretty significantly revamped the section of the strategic plan related to economic development and of the goals in the strategic plan, the Central Albany Revitalization Area, or CARA as we'll call it tonight, is the fourth goal. Uh, it's specifically called out in the strategic plan 
and there are specific goals related to the funding of projects in that urban renewal plan but that's how our work relates back to the city strategic plan now every year I use this uh, opportunity uh, to educate and talk about urban renewal so my apologies to those of you up on the dais who've seen this presentation before and know all this but I do want to make sure that all the budget committee members are up to speed on the tool of urban renewal and how it works so um, as we've discussed this is a little washed out but it's actually a map of the state of Oregon urban renewal is one of very few economic development tools that exists around the state of Oregon the other main one being enterprise zones it's used by over a hundred communities uh, there's over a hundred districts throughout the state of Oregon and it exists as a financing mechanism to address blighting influences and blight can be what you might think of run down um, dilapidated buildings but blight can also be the absence of infrastructure um, so there's different ways to look at blight. Here in Albany, we have used urban renewal going back to the 1970s. Uh, the map that you see there is actually a map from Albany's original urban renewal district that was in place, and it helped to fund the uh, infrastructure related to our central uh, commercial district, Fred Meyer and the like over in that area. And a lot of folks don't remember that we had districts going back that far. We also had the Oak Creek urban renewal area. Uh, it was there and really the capstone to the PepsiCo funding um, deal that we had with SVC. And then of course our central Ar Albany revitalization area, which is the district in place now. So when you create a district, um, you determine and make findings of blight, which is what we did back in 2001. And you define a specific area. Our boundary is 991 acres. And when you write your plan, you make a covenant with the taxing districts. And that covenant is basically an agreement of how much of their tax dollars you intend to use. And that is defined as the maximum indebtedness of the plan. For the CARA plan, that number is 56 million here in bold. So our maximum indebtedness is 50, 56 million. That's a very important number because you're basically agreeing to not use more than that number over the course of time for the urban renewal district. So this is a, another map of the district with some of the different zoning, and you all are familiar with Albany, so I don't sort of need to go through that. But I did want to highlight quickly the types of projects that are in our urban renewal plan. And this is really important because the plan is basically the guidebook and, and tells you what you can and cannot use these precious tax dollars for. Um, our our plan is very heavy actually with public infrastructure projects. Over 65% of the um, projects in the plan are slated to be public infrastructure type of work. However, so far, um, much of the work that we've done has been partnerships with public-private uh, types of entities and funding through grants and loan programs. And real briefly, um, the structure of our Urban Renewal Board, uh, of course, ultimately at the top, we always have the Albany City Council. But then in this case, we have the Albany Revitalization Agency, which are the city councilors themselves, but meeting as the agency. We also have a board of lay people, much like your board. It's the seven city councilors and then seven lay people that meet. And this is the group that really gets together and hashes out the policy decisions uh, and the funding decisions for the urban renewal district. And you all exist as the Albany Revitalization Area Budget Committee, and that's why we meet separately and hold this meeting prior to the city of Albany, because it is a separate government entity. Okay, so real quick, <laughs> again, we, I just want to go through this so we're all clear on how the mechanism of tax increment works so we get, when we get into talking about the details of the funding that we're sort of all on the same page. So when you create an urban renewal district, you have, again, a finite area, you've proven that there's blight, and in that area there are typically declining property values that aren't getting better. When you create an urban renewal district, you take a measurement at that time of the assessed value of all the properties in that area. Now, over the course of time, this amount, this red amount, which we call the frozen base, and that's that measurement that for us took place back in 2001, that amount of assessed value times the tax rate is going to continue to flow to the taxing districts, okay? It's only the increase in assessed value over time for that area that will come to the Urban Renewal Agency in the form of income 
with the idea that we put this money strategically back into projects that will eliminate blight, increase public safety, and create a stronger economy. Of course, the idea is then, at the end of the Urban Renewal District's time, that you will have a stronger community, a higher tax base than had you done nothing at all. It's, it's much similar to the idea of uh, saving early for your retirement. It's, it's investing strategically in these key projects to see this type of change occur throughout the area. Now this is an important slide because like anything there are costs and there are benefits. So this is a table that we uh, publish annually in a report that goes out that outlines the costs of urban renewal. And, and the costs are the revenue foregone by the taxing districts themselves. So what you see here is a list of the different taxing districts and then the amount, this is for year 13-14, uh, the amount of revenue foregone for each of those districts. Um, I've highlighted here with arrows uh, these three local option levies. And I have a slide here in a second that we're going to talk specifically about local option levies because Albany's district is one of about 20 districts throughout the state that has a, a funny and strange effect on local option levies, though that is just now changing. So we're going to talk about that in a second. The other thing I want to point out here is when we talk about revenue foregone, uh, the uh, school district here has an asterisk by it. The reason being is that is not a direct effect on Greater Albany Public Schools, but rather it's, effect, it's an effect on the state pot of funding because schools are funded on a per pupil allocation. There's an entire pot of funding for education at the state level that's doled out. So when we say that that number is 582,000, that 582,000 is coming away from the state's entire uh, funding pot for education. But of course, at this point in time, the legislature has deemed urban renewal to be an important enough tool that they backfill and make the education system whole um, and dole out those funds to, to the schools. All right, so here's my slide where we're going to get a little bit into the weeds on, on Albany's type of district, but this is a really important point that I want to make because this is um, we've had some legislation that has, has changed, in my opinion, for the better, uh, what had been really a, a mistake in the ORS. Until 2013, there were certain types of plans, type 3 urban renewal districts, of, like I said, there was about 20 throughout the state, of which Albany's was one, that had an effect on local option levies. It meant that our urban renewal districts were required, it was not a choice, but we were required to take funds from these local option levies in the taxing districts. We researched extensively ways to give the monies back, trying to fix this, and there were no legal means by which to do this. So in 2013 came a legislative fix in House Bill 2632, um, which I actually got to be at the table to help draft through my work with AORA. And what it did is it finally fixed that language and it said, okay, going for, forward, we're going to fix this so that these type 3 plans will no longer affect local option levies uh, going forward, any new local option levies. And the reason this is important is because this applies to any local option levy that is approved after January 1, 2013. And as you may be aware, if you got your ballot in the mail and live in Lynn County, you will have seen that our partners at Lynn County have their public safety levy that will be voted on on May 20th. And if that should pass, that would then fall under this legislation, which means these monies that had been flowing to us will no longer flow to us. Now, um, there is a caveat that they put in the law that allows urban renewal districts to opt out if the funds were necessary to make your bond payments, but I wanted to reiterate that is not the case with us. We have enough funding to cover our bond payments, so we don't need to worry about that. And moreover, we drafted and sent today a letter to, the, um, to Lynn County, and I've talked directly with the tax assessor, but this went to the commissioners uh, the county administrator, the tax assessor, as well as the sheriff to confirm that this is our understanding that we'll no longer be taking these funds and that we fully support the legislation. So I wanted to make you all aware of that um, because it's an important change. The amount that we're talking about here is about $325,000. Um, and so again, that's money that will go directly to the sheriff's levy should that pass. Um, we have 
have built the budget in a way which includes those funds because we don't yet know the outcome of that levy but should it pass those funds will simply come out of our reserve project line item which we have plenty of bandwidth for okay another <laughs> sort of uh, um, myth to dispel um, as you can see the point I really want to make here is that urban renewal is not an increase in people's taxes and I think many of you have heard this before but I just quickly want to highlight on a given property tax bill uh, let's look at this left-hand column. This would be a, a, a typical property tax bill with the urban renewal district in place. When folks get their bill, they open it up and they will actually see a line item marked Albany Revitalization Area with a dollar amount. And it's very confusing because it looks like this person is paying $28.35 to urban renewal. And again, this is a requirement of the legislation, the way it's written and the way the assessors are required to put the tax bills out. Now, in reality, if there was no urban renewal district, I think I've got a little highlight here, their tax bill would be exactly the same. They would be paying the same amount. So again, urban renewal is not an increase in taxes, rather it's the taxing districts themselves. So here, let's look at the city of Albany. In this case, the city of Albany is losing uh, $2.50 from this taxpayer. It's the, it's the taxing districts themselves that forego the revenue that funds urban renewal. Now, finally, I want to, um, I like to show this slide, and, and it is a hypothetical slide, but it, it, it's here to illustrate a, a key point. So what you're seeing in this slide is the green at the bottom is the actual um, frozen base that we talked about. That's that value that has continued to flow to the taxing districts. The red is a hypothetical 2% growth. This is what I put in like, okay, had we done nothing at all, and things continue to be blighted, perhaps we would have seen a 2% growth over time. The blue on the left are our actual tax increment numbers that we've seen coming through. And if you extrapolate those out, um, that's what the purple is. Now, the assertion of um, urban renewal supporters is that this is what we would call the urban renewal effect. This purple area is the amount of assessed value that you have on the books because you have eliminated blight. You have jump-started the economy by investing strategically in either public-private partnerships or public infrastructure projects that get things going again. And again, this, the whole idea behind this is a rising tide raises all boats. The taxing districts forego a finite of revenue. We and our policymakers decide which projects to put those into, and at the end of time, we have a, a greater tax assessed value base than had we done nothing at all. Um, another key point, and, and I'm, I'm pretty keen on metrics and really understanding the effect of the dollars that the agency is investing. And I think this is a really important slide to point out. And that is when we talk about public-private partnerships, and again, this doesn't apply to our public infrastructure projects, but when we're talking about public-private partnerships, so far to date, CARA has invested about 10.2 million in these types of projects, either through loans or forgivable loans or grants. The dollar amount of the private funds invested is $74.4 million, okay? Now, I, it is my assertion that when these folks come forward, they have to justify to the Care Advisory Board, to the City Council, why they need these funds, why these projects would not have happened without our dollars on the table. So the assertion is that we've been able to leverage, for every dollar of public money, $7.30 of private dollars into these projects that would not have occurred if our money wasn't on the table. Okay, so kind of a quick, this is my my USA Today version of uh, looking at CARA by the numbers. And, and these are just some important points that I wanted to make. Again, that maximum indebtedness number is, is incredibly important, 56 million. Now, as of um, this year, we have um, about 16 million that has gone against that maximum indebtedness number. Now, not all that spent, some, some of that sitting in our reserve fund but about 29, about 30% of that maximum indebtedness is now gone. That kind of gives you an idea of how far down the road we are with our urban renewal, leaving about 40 million available. Um, and I want to reiterate too that urban renewal districts complete 
when the maximum indebtedness has been spent and then repaid. Now the plan estimates a time frame, and that time frame was estimated to be fiscal year 2627. Um, but we're sort of lagging behind time-wise, partially because we took a break for a couple years. Um, we haven't been as aggressive in terms of borrowing. And so we are about 48% through the years, but we've only spent down about 29% of the money. So that just sort of is to illustrate that we're a little bit behind in terms of the estimated timing of things. Oh, and I am so sorry, my little things got so small. Well, at least you have pretty pictures to look at. <laughs> so I'll tell you what this says. Basically, this was just sort of a quick overview of some of the different um, types of work that we have going on now. We have um, four different active funding programs. The CARA Board took about two years off to retool the programs, really take a hard, long look at what they're doing, how they wanted to target and focus the investments. So we have four active programs. Um, on board right now and three more primarily focused on job creation and economic development that are slated to come online this this year. Um, we have a handful of active projects. Uh, these are projects that are under construction uh, or are an active drawdown and I always want to reiterate that all of our CARA draws, all of our CARA funding is always on a reimbursement basis. So the money does not go out the door until they can prove that the work was done and submit proof of payment on that work and then re we reimburse back out on the work that's been completed. So that's really important. Um, we also have 13 loans that we administer, and these are loans that are either uh, they're you know, making monthly or quarterly payments, or they're forgivable loans where we have to administer and uh, monitor the terms for forgiveness, and then work with our great friends in the finance department on the um, 1099s and the forgiveness and what that looks like. And finally, again, you can't read it, but active clients, um, I'm working with probably uh, almost 20 folks right now who are out there interested in either building or doing a project, uh, getting going with a grant or loan, kind of sniffing around with potential projects. So this is sort of just a quick overview of how, how our work helps our community. And I think you guys sort of know this, but we're here to create uh, a more livable, vibrant community. We want stronger, safer neighborhoods. I want to talk a little bit more about public safety in the next slide. Um, housing is a big part of what we do when we talk about the public-private partnerships because there is a belief that in order to create a stronger economy, you need to have folks living in the core downtown area or on the east waterfront. And if you have those folks living, then that will support your small business um, and economic development efforts that you're doing. Speaking of economic development efforts, um, job creation has been an area of focus in the past and even more so now with these focus programs and funding that we want to do. Um, to date, CARA has funded projects that created 130 new jobs. And um, I think there was a blog comment saying something about like, oh, they're probably including restaurant jobs. No. This 130 jobs, this is only family wage manufacturing jobs that were funded. Some examples include Viper Northwest, Hydration Technologies. So I'm, I'm not counting the construction jobs. I'm not counting the restaurant jobs. These are just true sort of manufacturing type of jobs. And 130 is substantial. If, if a company came before you today and said, hey, I'm going to bring 130 jobs to Albany, we would be all over that. And, and I'm really proud of that work. And finally, again, that, that private money leverage number, which we already talked about. Now, real quickly, on public safety, I, I wanted to hit on this because when we talked about the cost of urban renewal, I think a lot of people say, well, you, you know, the taxing districts have, have given up all this revenue, and here's this hard cost. You know, show me what you've done for it. And in many ways, defining how urban renewal district is shaping our community and measuring that can be challenging to do. But this is one of the ways that I want to illustrate that sort of ripple effect, and it is through public safety. Um, I did a study of eight just eight of our CARA projects that were uh, existing buildings that were on the ground before and that we helped fund changes to. In those eight buildings, we saw an average number of police calls per year go from 177 down to 38. And that is a substantial savings. And what that means, though, is not only is it literally saving money, but what it's really doing is allowing our police officers to have more bandwidth to respond to more critical issues rather than 
homeless people pulling copper wire out of the blighted old um, buzzsaw restaurant or things like that. And again, I can't put a, a specific number on this, but it is to illustrate that the investment in eliminating this blight increases public safety, and that's good for everybody. All right, so now into the heart of what you guys are really here for. So a couple, I want to sort of set the table with a couple of quick assumptions that I had and our board had going into the creation of this budget. First of all, um, in conversations about policy making, um, best practices throughout the state, and we had consensus from the Care Advisory Board, are that you would typically use your cash on hand to fund your public-private partnerships. That money can also go towards public partnerships. But you really want to use your borrowed funds to fund public infrastructure work. And the reason for this is you get lower interest rates when you go that route. It's a more typical approach for bond council because you come to them and say, we want to do project X. It will cost this much money, and this is what we want to borrow. And they say, oh, OK, in sort of, uh, sort of a nebulous, well, we want to partner with some folks, but we don't know why. So that's a really good way to go. They agreed that that's a good idea. The debt that we have on the books now, you, you may have read in my detailed breakdown, we only have one loan on the books. It's 2007 Series A bond. Uh, it's at 4.85% and it matures in 2022. This current fiscal year, we did achieve uh, a, a number of goals. One of them that was set at last year's budget meeting was to have the early payoff of the 2007 Series B bond. The reason we did that is it was at a higher interest rate, 6.25. We had the cash on hand, so we did that basically right at the beginning of July um, last year and got that off the books. Of course, we restructured the CARA programs, which I already talked to you about. And again, that pause on funding that the CARA board took has yielded really strong reserves, which you're going to see here um, when we delve into the budget. Okay, again, 5,000 foot overview. Um, the revenue amounts that we've got coming in, of course, our revenue comes from that tax increment amount. We've estimated that at 2.62 million. And again, that will drop should the sheriff's levy pass, and we're, you know, we're prepared for that. Um, loan repayment, beginning balance, and then that potential new loan. And again, I want to reiterate that the, the budget, the way it's written, creates the borrowing authority, okay? But it's the ARA ultimately that would make the go, no-go decision on that loan and what projects that loan, those loans fund would be used for. On expenses, um, we've got administrative and program costs, our debt service on the one loan that we're carrying, and then the final uh, draw for innovative housing. I want to note, and again, I put this in the detail, but I want to make a note and let you all know that of the other projects, the other grant or loan projects that are on the bo books, when I run my cash flow analysis, I assume all of those grants and loans will do a full drawdown this year. So that's already been taken into account. Um, if for some reason they don't draw down fully this year, at the beginning of the next fiscal year, we just put back any remaining balance. But that, those numbers have already been accounted for. And then finally, projects. This would be the other side. And again, these are those sort of two pots of money, if you will. The borrowing capacity that would be used for public infrastructure projects. And we are looking to hold an open house on June 4th to seek some public input as to prioritizing which public projects um, our citizens feel are, should, should be focused on next. And then the other pot of funding is uh, that reserve, which could be either for <coughs> public-private partnerships or for public projects. All right, and the other um, change uh, that was proposed in this year's budget that I want to hit on quickly was the uh, proposed addition of another FTE, and that's basically the reinstatement of the economic development officer role. Uh, this would see the FTE funded from CARA increasing from um, 0.8 to 1.4. I did want to reiterate that it's a reinstatement of the economic development officer role. So for example, when I started, this was the role I started into, and Dick Ebert at that time was economic development director. Um, when Dick passed away, 
um, the timing was not great to bring on a director and the city manager chose to leave that position unfilled until just last year when I stepped into that role and so we're looking to basically put the structure back now that I have additional responsibilities and have um, basically that coordinator or officer role below me which is what was in place before and I also want to um, reiterate that another thing <laughs> this graph here is is uh, this is our actual tax increment coming in the arrow here, that's when I started back in 06. Our tax increment was about 800000 Our tax increment now, which you could basically equate to our bandwidth, is $2.4 million. So our scope has tripled in terms of what we can do. And in many ways, the workload has become extraordinarily more substantial as well. And finally, it's important to note that um, the creation of this role does not affect the general fund because it will be funded primarily from urban renewal and best practices are that urban renewal should pay its own way related to staffing. And then um, the other small piece of that would come from the economic development fund that we'll be talking about on a later night and those funds come from transient room tax. So this isn't, this is, there's no net effect on the general fund. I just want to point that out. So another Beaver logo in to finish this off, but I, I want to say thank you. And at this point, I've got the detailed information. And if you all have questions on any of the specific line items, I'd be happy to jump into those. And of course, ultimately, we're seeking approval of the uh, proposed resolution that you would find on page six of your packet. All right, I know Rich has a couple questions. Let's start there. Actually, uh, the just to get a little more clarity, when you say that the TRT um, goes up and it looks like it's exponentially, you're also including any inflation. Um, this, are you talking about the tax increment? Right. I mean, so if in, if, if in 10 years your house went from $250,000 to $300,000 in value, what was inflation in that time in order to determine what we actually did you'd have to take that inflation rate out of it true that's absolutely right and the second thing when when you say that it doesn't cost any uh, there aren't any more taxes that's true however uh, when the street sweeper comes down and sweeps this street and you know, we don't get to charge more for it. You, we either have to lower, if we have less money, we either lower the amount of whatever it is that we do, or we find another funding source. So while the tax is not going up, it is coming out of the budget. I mean, you can't, you know, if you're taking X amount <coughs> out of street sweeping, you know, just because that was the example, you still have to either replace it with monies from someplace else or you have to do less street sweeping. True. One of course, the, the flip side to that argument, though, is that there is money on the books now that may not have been there had we not been making these investments. So it, it's, well, that's the other side of the equation. Yeah. 20 years, 30 years, if you go back 20 years from today, mm. what did diesel cost? $4 a gallon today, 80 cents. Yeah, I wasn't you know. driving then for the record. Oh. So I <laughs> but the bottom line is we're providing money at 80 cents a gallon, but we're having to spend $4. Now, that's an exaggeration because it's diesel. But, I mean, hamburger is the same kind of thing. I just, I just think it, it, it ought to be said that, you know, while it does make money, uh, it's not quite as, or I don't think it's quite as rosy as you, as you left the impression. Um, and I just wanted to make that point. Uh, just a couple of quick uh, comments, question, uh, and, a one, and a one question. Page three of the handout that you gave us uh, shows a couple of charts on the uh, public-private ratio and the CARA project by type. Yes. Okay. And I believe that's a reflection of the past, but it's going to be going further, going forward. It's going to be showing um, almost the reverse. It's going to be the public infrastructure as the largest chunk of that versus 
It's going to be flipping around? It's true. Okay. That's exactly right. Okay. At, at least that, looking into my crystal ball and guessing what you guys are interested in funding, that's, that's what I'm seeing. And then on, on the actual uh, budget, proposed budget, uh, which are on page eight, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the reduction of the overall funding from the public safety levy, presuming that it does pass, would be coming out of line item 69025. Yes, that's exactly right. Okay. That's where, yeah. And, and so Councilor Kopczynski is referring to the line item that is that reserve partnerships bucket, basically. And so, yes, that, that roughly what I estimate to be 325000 would come out of that line item. And that doesn't have any material effect on any of the potential uh, leveraging for borrowing or anything like that? That's just it a reserve that we have because of kind of our hiatus and everything else? Correct. Okay. Well, the, the three items on that slide that you had arrows by, only one of them would be not being, wouldn't be um, taken, those funds. So there, were, there were three numbers on that chart that added up to more than that. So it was just the one that was three something. Is this the one? No. No. Um, early on when you were looking at the oh. local levy. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. So on the local option levies, um, the other two are Lynn County has a second local option levy for the Veterans Home and the City of Albany has a local option levy. Um, those don't expire for a while. Should either of those entities choose to uh, put those out for a vote sooner rather than later, then we would cease to, to take those. But it is, it is on my radar and the finance director's radar and we're aware that those changes could happen in the future. Yeah, but they are actually uh, significantly less substantial than the sheriff's levy piece. Um, I, I actually reviewed your stuff backwards. I kind of looked at the budget first, and then I went and read all your narrative. And oh, no, that's okay. So I had a whole list of questions, and then I, when I read the narrative, I didn't have so many <laughs> questions. Hey, good. Okay, well, then the, I, it wasn't a waste um, of time. I'm glad. <laughs> I, I did have a little a question about the central service charges. I, I understand central service charges oh. and the theory behind them and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I was just wondering, any, I mean, the methodology between 110,000 for, I mean, you know, I mean, why that versus 180,000? Sure, and I, so the central service charges methodology is calculated by finance, so I might actually let so Stuart it's not calculate something that. that, that you even had any input I on? I did not. It is, okay. it is just, a, but what has changed is that in the past, the Urban Renewal District was not paying central service charges, and we felt that the time was ripe that it, it should be carrying its own weight in that regard. But I don't do the calculation on and that. And it might be, and, and, and I, I saw Stuart going to find a microphone probably, but. Oh. Um, <laughs> It, it might be something that versus now might be something Stuart covers when we go over the actual budget. I don't, I don't, I don't know, Stuart, if, it, if it's the same methodology, maybe it's just something we cover when we talk about the budget rather than at this point. You can clarify this one now, so um, sure. for, since it's a separate budget meeting. Just make sure it doesn't get skipped later. Sure. <laughs> We do have a methodology for the central service charges that are charged to all of the, the departments. Um, and we will identify in the finance budget and city manager and HR what departments are included in central services. But the formula is based uh, three different ways. One based on FDE. We identify the cost of human resources, those functions that are provided throughout the city, and those departments that have FTEs in their departments, full-time equivalent employees in their department, pay a proportionate share of the cost of HR. Uh, those are departments that use assessments, so there are operating departments that levy assessments for system development charges, uh, those types of charges. There's a function in finance that uh, does the billing for those assessments, so those charges are identified in proportion strictly to those departments that use that service. Then the balance of the costs for, for the central services are based, and let me remind me of the percent, Mike, because it's 60% based on size of operating budget and 40% based on full-time equivalent employees on the balance of the departments. And that would apply equally for CARE. The same methodology is used there. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I did have one other question, and it um, <coughs> goes back to page, it was page three. Um, actually, the same page Ray was referring to. The, the, the very first paragraph talks about um, 
the Crandall re Retail Refinement Study. Yeah. And, and I didn't notice anything in the budget that was specifically budgeted for projects coming out of that study. I is there anything specific? Or is it all just in the, 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 the infrastructure and partnership projects? Uh, it is all captured in those reserve line items because okay. the care advisory board hasn't determined which. But some examples of those projects, I think, as you know, would be uh, the potential for the slip lane. Right. Um, there was some property procurement that we had talked about. But again, that's um, a policy discussion that the care advisory board and, and agency are still working through. So those would come out of the reserve line items. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other Questions for Kate? Thank you. So we, we have uh, time here for further deliberation um, on the resolution that we have before us. Move for adoption of the ARA budget review resolution. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Motion carries. Is there any other business for this committee? Having none, then we'll adjourn the ARA Budget Committee meeting. <clears throat> okay, so I'd like to call to order the City of Albany Budget Committee meeting. And may I have a roll call, please? Collins? Here. Chrisman? Here. Pearson? Here. Keller? Here. Canopa? Here. Holden? Here. Olson. Here. Summers. Here. Pelham. Here. Connolly. Here. Kopsinski. Here. Coburn. Here. Johnson. Here. Thompson. Here. Thank you. And now uh, we have an election of the <coughs> officers for the Albany Budget Committee. Nominate the uh, the original three that are now serving. A second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Okay, motion carries. So, <laughs> so tonight we have the public hearing for state revenue sharing. This is a public hearing to receive public comments on the city's uses of state shared revenues as part of the proposed budget for fiscal 2014 and 2015. Public hearing is open at 7.12 p.m. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to comment? All right, the public hearing is closed at 7.13 p.m. Is there any public comment for the budget committee meeting? And we didn't have any emails or anything in our packet, nothing new for that. <coughs> All right. We have um, five sets of meeting minutes before us. Um, are there any comments or corrections on an individual? Need them one and all? We, we can do them together or it's fine. Without objection? Oh, that's right. no. Can I just ask mm -hmm. a question? Mm -hmm. On page 23, um, and maybe I missed it, but I'd asked, um, I mentioned that the non departmental Mental, the outside agencies um, only added up to 118,000 rather than 147. And um, Ed was going to get back to us. I don't see it the next day, and I don't see it anywhere where that other money went to. Now, did someone else just? Uh, I mean, it was just a, a comment because mm -hmm. he said he was going to bring it up, and mm -hmm. so. Because I noticed the same thing has happened this year, and so I just wanted to uh, bring it to our attention. Uh, I didn't find it anywhere that it had been actually dealt with. And I, you know, I, only I, I don't see it in the minutes, but I vaguely remember um, them 
find, finding it. It was just some sort of allocation, but I, I don't remember the details. Yeah, but so maybe when they can refresh us when we get to parks this year. Yeah. We'll be doing the same thing, so if you would remind me, I'll do it. I will. I've got it marked. Okay, thanks, Ed. Okay. Move to approve all. Second. All right. All those in favor of adoption of the minutes for the five meetings? Mm -hmm. Aye. 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 <laughs> Those opposed? All right, motion carries. All right, we're ready for the budget message, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the Budget Committee. It's my pleasure to uh, be able to present the fiscal year 2015 budget message. As you know, our fiscal year begins uh, on July 1st of 2014 and concludes uh, June 30th of 2015. As is my common practice, I'm not going to read the budget message that's contained in your, um, in your budget document, but I hope everyone has had a chance to take a look at it, and if you haven't, that you will. Uh, I'm going to try and summarize it, though, uh, using uh, just kind of an outline to go over some of the main points. And what I'm going to highlight is the high-level sort of view of the budget, and then Stuart is going to provide some details uh, prior to entering into the actual presentation of the line item budgets from the different departments. The most, I, I guess, one of the first things I want to say about this budget is that it is designed to carry out what is expressed in the city's strategic plan. Uh, we emphasize that. I think Kate brought it up in her presentation and, and did a nice job of highlighting that the the Urban Renewal Agency is a part of that as well, but that's, what we, that's where we get our direction from the City Council about what's important to the city citizens of Albany and how they would like to have their money spent. So it isn't an accident that in the city's general fund, 80% of our resources go to our police and fire departments. Um, that's a specific goal laid out in our strategic plan, and we allocate dollars accordingly. And you'll see that throughout the budget document, or at least I hope you will. And if you don't, you might want to draw it to our attention. Uh, the budget, this year's budget, uh, isn't proposing any huge new bold initiatives. We're not talking about, allocate, about big increases or making major changes in the way we allocate resources from what we've done in the past. Uh, it basically maintains service levels uh, that we have expressed that, again, that our citizens have expressed that, uh, uh, that they want to see from the city of Albany. Um, as I think everyone here knows, our general fund revenues have been essentially flat for the past five years. Uh, we have not seen uh, very much increase in assessed value, uh, in part because of what just happened over that period of time with the value of properties, both um, we all tend to think of it in terms of our homes, but of course there are, it has even bigger implications when you think in terms of uh, our commercial and our industrial properties. Uh, many people don't know, for example, that our largest single taxpayer, our, our largest single property uh, in uh, the city of Albany is actually the Target Distribution Center. Um, and uh, uh, those properties and what happens with their values obviously has uh, a major effect on the amount of money that we have available for general services. So we've coped with this flat revenue picture uh, by um, cutting some expenses uh, to offset increases in other expenses. Um, and the way I've expressed this in the past is that uh, we have built-in labor costs that go up uh, almost with beyond anything that we can really do to control them in any direct way. Um, and so we have countered that by reducing the number of people we employ. And also by making cuts in our materials and service budgets. And I don't think that that strategy is unique to the city of Albany. I think we've done it in a way that has been um, where we've tried to um, minimize the disruption to services, uh, to maximize the, the, use, the best use of our resources, and, um, uh, and I think, in general, um, we've done a pretty good job at that. Now, it, do that doesn't mean that we've done it without consequence. Some of our services have been stressed, and you will hear more about that from the department directors uh, as we go through the budget itself, that um, uh, they're finding that it's becoming increasingly difficult to meet all their service obligations with the amount of money that's being made available to them. 
And uh, uh, I'm sure they will be more eloquent about that than I will be. And, and part of the reason for that stress is that while our revenues have been flat, um, we're starting to see and have seen increasing demand for services. Uh, that's been particularly true in the, in the fire department, where, which has seen a pretty dramatic increase in, in requests for service. Uh, and, and what illustrates that point about what's happening in our community, in the first 10 months of this year, we issued building permits for 320 new dwelling units. Um, and that's a, that's a large increase over where we've been in the past. And that represents both apartments. I think we, the number of new apartments is like 179 new units this year, uh, which is maybe an all-time high in the time that I've been here. And then uh, the balance being single family, 140, I think, roughly single family permits. So, uh, and that's, again, that's not even a complete year. And we've been averaging mm, somewhere between 15 and 20 new single family dwelling permits every month. So, um, again, and it, there's a lag between these permits being issued, the new construction coming online, and the money arriving to actually deliver, to help cover the cost of delivering services uh, uh, to these places. So, uh, despite all of the, the gloom and doom, the fact that, we've ha that things have been tight and that we've had to cut costs, which I think many of us have had to do that in our personal lives as well as in your businesses, uh, there is some, some good news out there that we shouldn't ignore. Um, the city's financial condition remains sound, and that's not just the city manager saying it because it makes me look good. Um, there are independent sources that verify that information on a regular basis. And of course, the first is our annual audit that we receive from, from, our, audit, uh, from our auditor, our auditing firm. They come in, they look at our books, they tell our audit committee first, you know, what the condition of the city's finances look like, are our reports accurate, uh, they will make notes of, of weaknesses, and they have noted some. But in general, they will verify that the, the, uh, the, the condition of the city. And then secondly, we get reports from outside agencies as well who do ratings on the city's, basically the city's credit rating. And we've had, it, uh, I think it was the last year, we had a, a report from Moody's, which gave us a, um, uh, we maintained our bond rating, which Stuart has described as the highest bond rating possible for our city, given our demographics. And most recently, this year, we received a report from Standard & Poor's, which uh, also retained our, our, our credit rating, if you will. And uh, there's actually a report that we got uh, here a, a month or so ago. And I'm going to read a little bit from it, because I think it, it provides some assurance that the work you're doing, first, that the work that you're doing here is meaningful, it's important, and it has an effect, particularly over time. And I'll go into that a little after I read what they had to say. They said that in a very weak economy, that's their rating Albany's economy, um, with a projected per capita effective buying income of 85% of the national average, that, um, you know, that's not a particularly strong feature of the city. And that's not some new thing. That has been Albany's condition for some extended period of time. And I think there are a lot of reasons why that's true. They say Albany's manic management conditions are, in our view, very, in our view, strong with good financial practices under our financial management assessment methodology. The strengths of the assessment, in our opinion, include strong revenue and expenditure assumptions in the budgeting process, so what we've done in the past and what we're doing here tonight, strong oversight in terms of monitoring progress against the budget during the year, and strong investment management policies. Albany's budgetary flexibility is, in our view, adequate with available reserves at 5.4% of operating expenditures in fiscal year 2013. In our opinion, very strong liquidity supports Albany's finances with total government available cash at 80% of total, 87% of total government fund expenditures and at 9.9% debt, debt service. Based on past issuance of general obligation debt, we believe that the issuer has strong access to capital markets to provide for liquidity needs if necessary. In other words, they see us as a pretty good credit risk. And therefore, because of that and because of our reserves, they're giving us um, um, a good rating. Uh, we've heard a lot 
about Albany's debt. And we've heard criticism of the fact that, that Albany has some debts, particularly in our utilities. And here's what they have to say about that. Albany's debt and contingent liability profile is, in our view, strong. Total government fund debt service to total government fund expenditures is 8.9%, and net direct debt to total governmental fund revenue is 26.5%. In our view, the net debt to market value is low at 2.1%, which we view as a positive credit factor. And then finally, in their outlook, and this is critical to, uh, to the city uh, in terms of the cost that we as citizens pay, for the debt that we incur in the city, it says, the stable outlook reflects our view of the city's good FMA and st financial management, I'm sorry, I don't have the exact uh, acronym there, and strong management score, as well as the city's adequate flexibility score reflecting good reserve levels maintained during the past few years. Should the et city's economy score strengthen as a result of lower unemployment rates, and if the city's OPEB cost, that's our pension cost, decreases, uh, we could raise the rating. So what they're saying is, is that if our economy improved, if our unemployment rate goes down significantly, we could see uh, uh, an even better score. But, and, I, and I would advise anyone that's interested to look at, at the entire report and judge for yourself what it has to say. But it's pretty consistent with the feedback that we've been getting for a number of years. And of course, this pays off in a direct way uh, when we look at issues like refinancing the city's water debt that we did last year and the savings on that, I believe it was a 20 year, yeah, I mean, the amount was five and a half million over a 20 year period of time. I think we calculated it at over $300,000 a year in savings, which is, that translates, give or take, to about a half a percent uh, increase in uh, water rates that we don't have to do because we have, we were able to incur that savings. So these are, those are, uh, in my view, an important element of what we do here when we're putting the budget together and, and not something that we should lose sight of as we think in terms of, you know, does any of this really matter? Um, so, um, having said all of that, that the, the we're, we were talking about essentially a maintenance of service level budget uh, with no huge new initiatives. Um, there, is, there is some stress on our ability to do everything that we've been doing, but we think we can continue to do it, at least for the next fiscal year. Our financial condition is rated as sound. Uh, one of the issues that has been raised is that, well, what about alternatives? What about looking at different ways of doing things? And, of course, there are many different ways that we could deliver services to the citizens of Albany. Um, and we've discussed a number of them over the years. The city council, some members of the city council may recall that some years back, the fire chief and I, or the fire chief at the time, I won't, I won't pin this one on John because it came from Kevin, uh, approached the council to talk about the idea of, of forming a fire district, which we believed would more equitably spread the costs of providing fire service to the community, fire and ambulance service, across a broader base. And at the time, that was viewed as something that we didn't want to look at. So we, we opted not to go down that road. Uh, you may also recall that um, um, Ed Gallagher, our library director, brought a plan forward to the council at one time to look into the idea of forming a library district based on the same function. Now, I have to tell you that as a city manager, that, that took a lot of swallowing for me because I was always taught in, that you know, balkanizing your services isn't necessarily a good thing. That it's nice to be able to set community priorities under one policy setting board, the city council. But, you know, I, I think we all have to be honest with ourselves. Oregon's system of financing its public services is broken. And it's been broken for a long time. And it's becoming increasingly difficult for jurisdictions to be able to deliver the services as we have in the past, the service levels that we have in the past, uh, using the funding mechanisms that we currently have. And so there have been a number of jurisdictions that have done exactly those things that we talked about and rejected, going to m delivering more services through districts um, and doing less through city government. Um, another option that we have exercised here in the city in different times and places is privatizing. Um, of course, we, we have 
on, on a number of ways, privatize some of our services. We privatize some of our park services, for example, our mowing. Uh, we do a contract. Um, throughout the city, we now have temporary or contract employees doing jobs that formerly were done by full-time equivalent employees. Um, that's been part of that. That's been how we've been able to help try and manage the workload at a time when we've been cutting our, our labor force. The other option, of course, another way to, to, to look at that is the, just the flip side. There's the possibility of doing like what Millersburg is now discussing, and that's having a public entity taking over what had been a private service, privately provided service, and looking at that as a revenue source. Um, that's an option that's available. So I, I guess my point in talking about alternatives is that there are an almost infinite number of them when you're talking about a budget as large as ours is, is, and when you talk about an organization that has a scope of responsibility as broad as the city of Albany, that you can talk all day about alternatives, and we're, you know, we can come up with analysis and answers to the best of our ability. Um, but some of these questions are very, very difficult to answer, and I'm sure the folks over in Millersburg right now <laughs> could give you an earful uh, about how difficult it is to determine whether or not it's to their advantage to proceed with a plan that was actually brought to them by one of their leading employers. So, again, our budget doesn't propose to do any of those things. Our budget is very similar to the budget that was presented to you last year. Uh, there are a few changes, and I think they're noted, and, and they will certainly be discussed by the individual um, uh, 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 department directors and their staff who have put the budget together. And with that, I would be glad to answer any general questions about the budget and the philosophy that we used in putting it together. Questions for Wes? Maybe, yeah. maybe uh, Wes, maybe not, um, maybe not so much, well, it'll eventually turn into a question, but a comment as much as anything else. Um, you know, one of the things that, that um, we've heard several years now is, is um, the pressure that's being put on, on services through the different departments. Um, and, and at some point, um, there may be a need to eliminate, reduce, do something with those services because like you say, there's a lag time. So even though we may have building going on in the city, we may not see that revenue until down the road. So there may be, may be um, a need to, to um, change some of those services, reduce those services, eliminate some. Um, and, and without a, um, without a real, good list of priorities to do that, I would think it would be pretty difficult for staff to, to, um, to do those kinds of things. So at, at what point do you think it's important, or at what point would it be helpful to, for staff to have that kind of a, of a list, or for even the council to have that kind of a list, where, you know, at some point we, we will have to do X. Or actually, it shouldn't be put that way. At some point, somebody's going to have to make a decision, the council, that X will have to be taken from the budget. Um, and here's the four areas that it can be taken from. You know, and, and again, long drawn out question, but, but in, in my mind, I mean, there's, there's really, um, you know, there's, there's basically three sacred things in the budget, police, fire, and, and, and basic infrastructure, making sure we have water, streets, sewer. Um. Yeah, Jeff, I, I think to some extent we do that in the strategic plan. I mean, we try and lay out what it is that we think we want for our community. I mean, we start with the themes. We say this is what we're, you know, these, these four themes are the things that we emphasize, our, our great neighborhoods, and then we have things under that that help us define what we think great rep neighborhoods represent. I had an opportunity yesterday to do a tour of the canal with the city manager from Lebanon. And it was kind of proud, you know, we were showing him Albany and we were winding, following the path of the canal through the city. And, you know, it's spring, <laughs> the city really looks nice. <laughs> and, uh, and it, you know, you take a little pride in, in going through the historic neighborhoods and you see the value of the long-term commitment to those goals and those programs 
that the city has funded over the years. And so, again, you get a sense of what great neighborhoods means and safe neighborhoods. And we see that reflected when we find that Albany is, was recently rated as the safest city in Oregon of, of our size uh, for, in terms of violent crime. Um, um, you know, effective government, well, you know, we could provide plenty of evidence, I think, of how that works and what are some of the elements. So again, I, the strategic plan would be my guide to where we would look in terms of, okay, what are our critical priorities and where, do we, where would we want to make changes? But I, I'm not sure I'm as convinced that the starting assumption is that sometime, at some point, we're just going to have to cut services. I mean, and partly that's me. I mean, my view is, is that my job is to try and deliver on that strategic plan. And if it's really strategic and it has meaning, then over time we have, you know, it's our job is to deliver on that and to figure out ways, creative ways, to, to, to keep those services going as opposed to actually cutting those services. Um, and and I, I'm a bit of an optimist. I mean, you know, um, I've seen, I've been through doing this for 30 years, and I've heard tales of gloom and doom. Uh, my worst story, I told this to somebody not long ago, was the time when I was on a school board. And the, the staff told us that if they didn't get a passage of a $650,000 levy, that we were going to have to lay off teachers and class sizes were going to go up and everything you know, was going to be awful. And we all said, oh my. And so we went out and worked our tails off to try and pass the levy, and it failed. And then when it did, the staff came back to us and said, well, it wasn't as bad as we thought. And it turns out we won't have to lay anybody off. <laughs> and so I've, I've always been a little reluctant in the first place to give too much gloom and doom. And I know the council has from time to time chided me and said, well, you know, you shouldn't be such an optimist. But I, I, I guess that was an example of where being a pessimist was not a particularly good thing. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think part of our job is to manage as best we can, figure out how we can keep those services that people say they want and that we see the evidence that they need or that we need in the city alive and, and going strong. Um, having said that, you know, I think when you, you know, there are some fairly obvious areas that might be more discretionary than others in terms of where, of what programs that you provide. And, uh, um, you know, when you get to the point where you feel that we don't have any choice, uh, or where you have to make a choice. And it may not, again, it may not be a cut. It may be a different way of doing it. Um, you know, Salem looked at their ambulance service and the way things were with their fire department and made a decision that they were going to privatize their ambulance service. Because in their city, under their circumstances, they felt that that was a better way to get the job done, deliver the service, without having to reduce it. Now, we, I see people shaking their heads here because in Albany, we tried that some years ago and exactly the opposite happened. It worked for about a year, or yeah. didn't work for about a year. Yeah, it was a disaster apparently, and the city ended up taking it back <coughs> over, and, and we've had it ever since. And, and I'll be honest, I don't see the economics of it because we're responding on every emergency call anyway. But, but the point is, is that there are, there are a range of options about how you deal with the issue of either flat or declining <coughs> revenues, and, and I think you have to look at all of them. So I'm sorry, that's a long-winded answer to a very... That was a long-winded question. Well, it was a, it's a pertinent question, but it, it, to me, I don't think we're there okay. at this point where we have to say, oh, and, and, I, and I think the destructive, there is a destructive element of saying, well, we could live without that service and that service. I mean, I think it's, it's, it, it, it tells the public, well, you know, this really isn't all that important. And not to mention the people who are currently delivering that service, it tells them you're, you're less important than, you know, these other people. And um, I, if we don't have to do that, I would rather not do it. Um, but again, the ultimate decision there is, is a decision from the policymakers, from you and the public as a whole. If you feel that we're doing things that we ought not to be doing um, because of the effect on your taxes or, um, uh, you know, the effect on our financial condition, then that's a message we need to hear and then we can maybe, we can go to work on it. Well, kind of in that same vein, from, but from a different perspective, 
I think it is valuable for any organization that uh, I know that this this body has been I mean the body as the city has been going downhill in in um, numbers of employees and having tightened budgets over and over and over and over it occurs to me that one of the best places you can find to make efficiencies is the people who are standing next to you when you're having to look at it and knowing that there is a priority whatever that priority is what is it that we can get away with the best and and it, right now it's not a good time to do it it's a good time to do it in the middle of the summer or in the in a time when you're not forced to deal with budget numbers but having a list of priorities uh, at the beck and call of each manager so if something does come up it's we're going to trim a little bit off the toe we're not going to cut off the foot um, I mean when people are faced with big problems sometimes they make rash decisions and the smallest excision is better uh, if if you know that you can make it so from that perspective I guess I'd I don't know if it's the other side from what you said, but it's, I guess, alongside um, Mr. Christman's thought process that the thought needs to be made, I yeah. think. Yeah, and, and I, I guess I would argue, Rich, that it is being made, and it has been made. I mean, there's a reason why we now have a community development director slash public works director who will follow me after, well, he'll follow Stuart, actually. Mm -hmm. He's the guy in the suit. Uh, and so anyway, uh, you know, there are reasons why Mark did a reorganization of his department that cut some positions and he's now he's either he's got some new reorganization going on. There's, you know, reasons why we didn't replace Bob's position at the same level that it had been. I, I mean, we are always looking for ways that we can continue to meet the goals of the strategic plan, deliver the services that have that we've been told the people of this community want and doing it in a different way um, uh, and and as you say looking for those opportunities to make a cut here or a slice there or, you know it differently doing it differently to figure out a different way to do it so I I think that's very much I don't I, I, I hope that that isn't the message I was giving to you is that we're not doing that because we are I mean it's happening routinely in the city well I guess what I would I guess maybe divert a little bit if if the council knew kind of what that list could be and that I don't mean that we should put it in the paper I mean it's yeah. part of having to cut a budget is is feeling that you know if you take the this next step that it's going to be safe mm -hmm. and if you don't know what that is the next step might be going off the cliff and you don't know that so it's, I mean, it's just a little bit more information. Okay. And Wes, on, this is still in the budget summary. It's on page 95, 96, and 97. It's the personnel change report where you need a road map to follow. Well, could we have some more discussion on this priority thing? Oh, sure, if you want. So can you bet? Ray, was your, was your comment on something along the lines of what Rich was and Jeff were saying. Oh, go ahead, mm -hmm. go ahead okay. and then no, I, th I think it goes back to kind of like what Wes was saying earlier. It's all driven by the strategic plan, which goes back then to the department heads who work it backwards based on the estimated revenues coming in. Uh, and when I, when I look through the summaries and I see contingency reserves, you know, they're, they're doing their best job of planning for some of those types of issues and the one thing that can come up and bite everybody is a catastrophic issue of some sort then the whole budget gets tossed into a uh, something and everything has to get reworked but in general the the planning that I see starting with the strategic plan working through here uh, without going in and, and going into some serious minutia uh, I think that the reports that are coming from the, the auditing professionals uh, are indicative of the fact that uh, 
the city is doing an adequate and even a good job of managing those resources in a, in a declining market. So. Yeah, I, uh, I'm going to object to this uh, idea of having a, a hit list as to uh, uh, which departments or parts of departments or people uh, ought to be the first to go if, uh, if we have uh, hard financial times. Uh, you see it in athletic teams, you see it in classes, uh, you see it in families, you see it in neighborhoods that um, people who consider themselves as kind of second grade or not, not top of the heap, they don't have the enthusiasm to get the job done. And I think it is a very poor idea to, to start forming hit lists of uh, who you're going to drop off first. So I'm glad you didn't uh, agree with that. Wilson. And I guess, I guess the comment that I would make is that I'm not sure if we, I don't think that the counselors or, or Jeff were asking for a hit list of what programs or individuals would be eliminated. I think we're looking at priorities and areas at which uh, we could target alternative revenue sources or target creative ways to be more efficient through automation or software or things like that and obviously there are consequences if we don't do something and I, I know we've got a great and favorable review from several of the auditing agencies at the same time not to use your words against you but to use your words against you um, in the first page of your your budget message it says that it is unlikely for the general fund uh, revenue sources that they will increase sufficiently during the next few years to cover the increased operating costs we are likely to incur. And if you flip to page 20 in the graph where you show general resources and requirements and you show the graph starting to intersect, we may not be there today, but we may be there in the next one to three years. And, and I think that when we take a look at a, a list of priorities and we take a look at a a group of methodologies to accomplish those priorities or that hit list, even though it may be seem negative, but it's their, their target areas for us to improve or to address. I think that we, I think it takes one to three years for us to implement a software solution that might increase efficiencies that would prevent a staff reduction or elimination of a program. And if we continually look at this as a once-year step, as a budget committee, not as staff, uh, that might be difficult to forecast those programs three years in advance and say, here's something that we're going after because it is a priority and here's where we can get the greatest gain. Um, I really believe that, that any time we're looking at the budget, we're looking at reducing our expenses or we're looking at increasing efficiencies or we're looking at increased revenue sources. And I think those are all themes that just need to be in the plan. And I'm sure we're going to talk to each one of the department heads about how they're going to address those. But maybe it's one of those things we see in a priority list that says, here's the areas we're targeting and this is what it'll do to the general fund that might delay that intercept of revenue and expenses that, you know, graphs speak a thousand words, but it, it sort of looks like a, an intercept in one to three years unless something in our economy changes. And a lot of us are very pessimistic about the economy doing anything in the next one to three to save us. Well, well, what's happening, what we are seeing, not just here but in other cities around the state, is a, is a definite change for the better in terms of the trend. And so, well, again, I, I did make the, the pessimistic pro projection that I think we, we still face a challenge in meeting that uh, in, a, in delaying or hopefully make never seeing that, that intercept um, uh, uh, where expenditures are, are you know, exceeding revenues. Um, I still think there's a pretty decent chance that we could see a change. And there are reasons for us to be optimistic about that. Um, and, and again, I, I don't think, I, I mean, I think we've kind of cast this in, in two extremes. I, I don't, I'm, I, didn't, I didn't hear hit list, and I, I wouldn't approve of one if I did, so I agree with Dick on that. On the other hand, I think it's, it's, it's appropriate to be doing exactly what you're saying, Scott, which is thinking about, um, you know, what are the things that we can do to ensure that we don't 
go under, that we don't fall into, a, into bad financial practices. And, and of course, I guess my argument is, is that, and part of why I brought up the report is, is that I think we've been doing a pretty good job of that that we have looked at, at software solutions and we've made some fairly major investments in software to try and assist with, so that instead of, for example, adding new staff in the building department, we've used contracting and we've, we're implementing the eDocs program and updating Permit Plus and that sort of thing. So all of that, and, and that all gets reflected in the budget and in, in, our, in the course of, of uh, of requests made to the council on a regular basis. And, you know, I, I wish I could say that we had this down to such a science that we could, we could project exactly when we, we think we need to implement something. But uh, sometimes it's a case of opportunities. We become aware of an opportunity or an opportunity is presented to, to us by the retirement of an employee or the arrival of a new employee with a skill set that we, uh, you know, maybe hadn't envisioned. Uh, and so we're able to do some reorganization and save in that way. But, but I, I mean, I think this is good feedback, and, and I, I think all of us take it to heart. And uh, uh, we, that really will be, I think, reflected in the reports that you hear from the directors about what they're doing uh, to try and meet that challenge. I just throw out one last little comment with that. So just so that you know where I'm coming, I, I don't want to preach doom and gloom either. My goal <coughs> in looking at the budget this year and having the first time to be a part of this my goal is how do we spend more money on people and get more people with fire, more people with police, and how do we become best in class as far as, far as one of the top cities in the state of Oregon, if not the country, in doing what we do. So I'm not looking at how do we do more with less people. I'm looking at doing how can we do more with more people and become best in class. So I don't want to constantly look at this and say how do we cut, cut, cut. I, I want to find ways to make more money so we can spend, spend, spend. Yep. And there's, again, that's part of the, right. the whole process here. And you just heard a report from Kate, uh, Kate about one tool that we try and use to do that. And there will be others that will come up in the, the course of the discussion. Floyd? Yeah, I think one of the, one of the ways we, uh, we try to approach that, I think, is um, Daniel Lee Stewart does a five-year projection in the general fund. Mark does five-year projections in the <coughs> utility funds. So we document the assumptions and we take a look at what the trends are and we look for those intercepts out there. And if, they, if they're going to occur in three years, we try to address them in year one. So I think that, that forward-looking projection uh, is very, it's a valuable process. I think what we tend to do though is when those come to us, it's a whole bunch of numbers and we're looking five years in advance, and we look at the, oh, well, it kind of looks okay, but we don't pay a lot of attention to it unless we see a problem out on the horizon somewhere. So I think that tool of using a five-year rolling forward-looking process is very valuable. And then we ask ourselves when we take a look at those, so what are those trends telling us? You know, are we closing or are we holding steady or are there other things coming down the road that we aren't currently doing? Like Mark will tell us, we got stormwater coming and we're not funding it, so what are we going to be doing with it? Uh, we've known that now for over 10 years and we're getting close to the point where we're going to have to really address some of those. But those are the tools that we use to accomplish the very thing you and Jeff and Rich are talking about. That's it. Yeah, the question on page 95? Uh, yes, all of these um, reclassifications, um, transfers, and whatever. I mean, it seems like every year we go through these um, just huge uh, changes, and I'm sure there's a good reason for them. But uh, I had a question. Um, what is the... Uh, the amount of hours, is it half time or what where employees get benefits? Um, I believe they are eligible for benefits at anything over 20, 24 hours? 32? I'm not sure. 20? 20 and above. Okay. So, it is, so, so if you're 20. a, a, a point 0.5 employee, then you do get benefits? you get access to some benefits. I mean, it's not, you don't get the same as a full time, but yes, you, for example, health care, you would be able to take advantage of the city's health care plan, but you'd have to pay a, a rate different than if you were a full time employee. 
just an example here, um, and it's on the library. Reclassify vacant uh, FTE librarian one position to two point five FTE library eight positions. So, I mean, it concerns me that we're, I mean, I understand you want to save money on benefits and stuff like that, but here you have two that don't get benefits where you had one that did. And it seems like there's quite a few of these that are, um, you know, the same thing. I mean, they're, they're moving around and whatever. And it's, it's hard. It's very difficult to keep track of. I mean, I've got more highlights on this page. So I had to get them highlighters. Yeah, what I would do, Bessie, is, or what I would advise is, you know, each of these are specific to the different departments. Right. And so you're going to have a chance to grill uh, the directors on why they're proposing a reclass of a particular position. And I, you know, we've gone through it. They've explained to me what they're reasoning for. We, we, we have a, you know, the, what we call our BUD4 process, budget, four, budget form number four, which, uh, you know, uh, seeks to document and justify why people are doing what they're doing. Oftentimes it's because we see cost savings in doing it. And sometimes it's actually at the request of an employee. They say, you know, I would prefer to work fewer hours. I want to stay home more hours and that sort of thing. And if we can accommodate that and accomplish the task, accomplish that same uh, task with fewer resources, then that works pretty well for us. Uh, we have, for example, you know, we ha I, can, I know of three positions in the city that I can think of off the top of my head that used to be full-time city employees with full benefits now being filled by retired employees with no benefits at half time. Mm. Now there's some stress on those people to get everything done, but because they were senior experienced people who knew their jobs really well and you know, the jobs haven't changed dramatically, we're able to get really good value from those folks and, and continue to receive uh, a very high level of service from them. Um, I regard those people as champions and you know. I, do, I mean, probably, yeah. but you know, it just it concerns me that okay, that that happens, that mm -hmm. you know, instead of having full-time employees, you know, with a family wage job, uh, then it goes to half-time that don't have it. Where you know, you, it, basically, the retired people are taking away jobs from regular people. Well, you know, but there, the know. good news is, is that we didn't have to lay off someone and, and, you know, mess up someone's family, and those people still get to eat too, which is a good thing. So, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't know if this you would cover it or it would be no, that departmentalized. Will, so that's fine. I, I, I would. Do I that. mean, they're again, they're explained here. So if it, whatever de level yes. of detail mm -hmm. you would want, I would be sure to ask it of the of the individual director. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Wes. Thank you. Next victim. So, Chair Bolden and members of the Budget Committee, here we are again. <laughs> I must be getting older because these seem to come around pretty often. <laughs> it seems like more frequently than they used to. Um, I hope to be pretty short in my comments. We actually, the directors had a run through a uh, week and a half ago on our presentations and felt that a a section that kind of gave some of the parameters that were looked at in building the budgets would be helpful at this point. And so that's my purpose. And I'm just uh, going to touch on a few of the assumptions that were made in the budget and then point out some information that the budget committee has requested in prior meetings and give you a little sense of some of the things that have been raised already, some of the good issues that were raised in the questioning with Wes on some of the thoughts and and struggles in building the budget. Um, and as, as in the past, too, want to thank you very much for your participation on the Budget Committee, uh, both in the time in the Budget Committee meetings, and I know a lot of time in between Budget Committee meetings, and uh, appreciate participation from Budget Committee members on audit review committees and uh, committees to exam to review proposals for new auditing services and we have actually coming up a, a review of investment advisory services and uh, budget committee members have been always been very willing to participate and lend assistance in those areas and that's very appreciated so 
I want to first of all touch upon some of the parameters that impact the general fund and assumptions that were made. And we've talked a little bit about estimating growth in the general fund and uh, future revenue sources or future revenues that would be available. In the proposed budget that you have that you're considering, uh, the assumption on assessed gro uh, uh, growth and assessed value is 3% growth. That compares with current year actual growth of 2.18% and the year before that, 0.1%. So the trend, as Wes was suggesting, is there is greater development going on in the community. There is growth in assessed value. It's interesting that Benton County has tended to lag Lynn County. And Lynn County actually saw more growth in the current year than did Benton County. Uh, Benton County, uh, the prior year, it was reversed. And so the anticipation is, viewing those trends, that going forward, we'll see uh, better growth in Benton County in next year as well. And so the combined growth, the estimate is 3% growth in assessed value. Uh, public safety compression, which is a major impact on revenues in the general fund, specifically for police and fire. And we've seen some pretty tremendous increases in compression over the last four and five years even. It's, it's been quite a while where that's been a major impact. And in this next year, or uh, as I could also describe the most recent history, there has been lower growth, but there still has been significant growth in the amount of compression. And the current, the estimate in the proposed budget is that compression will continue to grow, but at a lesser rate, and we estimated growth of 12% compression in next year. Of the estimates that uh, were made as the budget was put together really in February, as we start January and February, start making the assumptions for the budget, this is the one that I have least confidence in. I suspect, especially if the public safety levy for the sheriff's office passes, that compression uh, could very likely uh, increase above 12 percent. So that one I have the least confidence in. I think we're, I feel pretty confident still in the assessed value growth and uh, we'll be fine in those areas. Uh, as the budget committee can remember, in the current year, we were impacted, our general fund revenues were impacted by the HP decision. And uh, um, although we didn't benefit in the payments that were overpaid, we get to participate in the payment to reimburse the over, over payments that HP did for property tax payments. And so the city's portion in the current year was $300,000 that we, uh, of revenue that we had in our budget that we wouldn't receive then from, from Benton County. Uh, there's an additional withholding that will be made in the year 14-15 year budget. However, it will be significantly less and the impact of the City of Albany is about $30,000. They're withholding $9 million countywide in Benton County for an additional uh, reserve payment and in the event the appeal from Benton County is not upheld. That was so, my question. Uh, is there any news on the appeal? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, there was uh, a meeting has been several months ago. I haven't had an update. And I, I, several months ago, I think it was even back in January. Uh, so I haven't had more recent. There was some discussion between HP and the state, which included representatives from Benton County on exploring possibilities of some intermediate role. Uh, the takeaway was that HP officials said they weren't aware how broad the impacts were. Uh, and they felt the impact would be as their payments were received by City of Corvallis where the assessed value was, but the payback on the overpayments on the reimbursements, all of the overlapping jurisdictions are impacted. So that was the, uh, the aha moment, I think, for HP, realizing that every agency, every taxing district in the county was impacted by that mm -hmm. decision. But uh, still, it uh, should be appropriately applied and assessed. Uh, uh, they certainly were within their uh, prerogatives to file that appeal, to have it reviewed in the process, and we'll follow through uh, that process and, um, and adjust accordingly. Uh, this budget has, and some has been referred to, some transfers in, transfers out, and I, I want to mention a, a couple of those. Uh, because they're fairly significant in the budget in this year, and they're how we approached, as Wes was describing, maintaining service levels in some different departments. Um, one is a, a transfer from the, uh, from the Pepsi settlement proceeds in support of equipment replacement. And on the next screen, it's, and all these slides are on the dais on your screen. You want to look ahead, and we'll look at equipment replacement and how well those are funded in different operating departments. 
Uh, a second one, I, uh, oh, and I also want to mention with that, in 2012, uh, the Equipment Replacement Fund transferred $300,000, or excuse me, um, how that work? Yeah, the Equipment Replacement Fund transferred $300,000, no, that the, where am I getting? Yeah, the Equipment Replacement Fund transferred three hundred thousand dollars to the general fund in order to balance services there, and this would be a repayment then to the Equipment Replacement Fund of that transfer of two years ago from the Pepsi settlement proceeds. A second big transfer or movement of resources uh, has been referred to in previous discussions with the Budget Committee and City Council, and that is using some of the in lieu of franchise fee revenues that are received in the street fund from payments from water and sewer. Um, all the utilities in the community pay a franchise fee. This would be a, uh, the portion of franchise fee that is paid by water and sewer is, has previously been directed to the street fund in support of capital projects. And the proposed budget includes a transfer of about half of that in lieu of franchise fee or $500,000 uh, come to the general fund uh, instead of to street capital. And the budget also proposes that there be identified capital projects uh, that may be that are eligible for other funding sources, uh, such as CARA funding, where street projects and infrastructure projects that are consistent with the goals and objectives of CARA could be funded from that source to offset the or to maintain the capital investment in the street fund. So. Obviously, as you would expect, that's not a sustainable practice, but in the short term where those projects can be identified, it can help mitigate, uh, reduce services or maintaining or help support maintaining those services. Uh, also in the general fund, uh, Wes referred to some restructuring in the public works and community development departments. And in previous budgets, both water and sewer have contributed $50,000 each to the general fund in, su in support of planning services, and the planning division is funded in the general fund. Uh, those contributions from water and sewer are eliminated in the proposed budget, uh, largely due to the restructuring that uh, Mark will speak to more specifically, uh, and those are really replaced with uh, uh, reduced staffing in the general fund in the planning division and then that substituted with uh, those positions now being, act or those services being provided through Public Works Administration and uh, coupled in with Public Works Admin Charge that is charged to different services in Public Works and that'll be part of Jeff, or part of Mark's presentation as we move there. So on the expenditure side, a uh, couple, I do want to point out a, or move to a slide that would uh, show what really where some of our largest constraints are, and that is in personnel costs. And the largest expenditure items are personnel costs and capital projects. And those are uh, policy choices and decisions that the Budget Committee and City Council consider. And then as uh, has been referred to several times, the st strategic plan is the guiding document. In every line item detail page, or opposite each line item detail page in the budget, we have a page called Program Narratives. And within that program narratives, we identify strategies and actions and those specific objectives in each department and how they address uh, different objectives and goals of the strategic plan. In the adopted budget, we also include a section, and there's uh, the section in this year's budget is on page six, and that's updated each year and included in our adopted budget where we give more specific examples of the ties between the strategic plan and strategies and actions in the different operating budgets. I uh, mentioned wanted to refer to one item, and this is one the uh, Budget Committee had asked for additional information on, and that's how well funded we are with equipment replacement. Uh, as an example, this has been one of the places that we have cut in meeting, uh, in maintaining services. And particularly, you'll recall, uh, I think for several years, uh, both police chief and fire chief mentioning that equipment replacement was not being funded. That's reflected in these numbers. What these bar charts represent would be full funding for equipment replacement of the rolling stock primarily uh, and major equipment in the different departments. So in the case of fire, there's a large unfunded component and in police, a large unfunded component. And actually, the for police, I want to make sure I mention 
the part that, uh, that shows funded largely pays for leases for patrol cars. So uh, that's an annual and ongoing cost. So it's, it's a little misleading to think it's funded to the level it is because most of that is addressing lease payments. And the balance of rolling stock in the police department is uh, kind of reflects similar to the fire. It's not very well funded at this point. And another caveat I want to mention with the fire department, that by far is the largest, uh, the bar that's unfunded, but the largest equipment in the fire department also has a much greater uh, useful life than other equipment in the city, and a greater useful life also means greater opportunity to fund in future years. You have more years to build a reserve to make the purchase. Uh, we are, uh, did make a purchase in the current year of the large fire truck, and those are those are, that's those are large expenditures. And each chief, I think, will want to give more detail on how those are how they're faring in those in those different areas. Stuart, before you before you move yeah. on, can I ask a question real quick? I want to make sure I understand the unfunded part, especially in the fire. So, so is that is that the unfunded? Unfunded equipment as of in this chart, I guess 1231.13, is that taking into consideration, you know, or how far out into consideration is that taking future needs? Or is that just what's unfunded as of that point in time? I guess I didn't understand the comment about it, it, they're large items so they can have a longer useful life. I, I read this chart as we have that chunk of unfunded equipment right now as of 1231. That's correct. That's a correct reading. Okay. So as of 1231, and let me describe in our budget process, when we have our initial meeting where we meet with the directors and describe what revenues are available to build our budget, um, we identify what internal charges need to be included in the budget. We also present this these numbers, the raw numbers to each department, and say if you were to fully fund, and as you're suggesting, Jeff, what we have is a uh, detailed spreadsheet of all the equipment that's included in the equipment replacement program, the, the expected life, remaining life of that equipment, and the cost to replace. So the cost to replace divided by the number of uh, useful years remaining uh, I creates that number. So. Yeah, if we're under, so then each department director, as they build their budget, and has been the case in the last few years, they're, they've identified that that's not been funded. And they, as you can see, different departments have been able to fund that equipment replacement light on them uh, different ways or in, at different levels. So, um, so for fire, that's not equipment that needs to be purchased now. You're just you're you're just saying this is unfunded reserve for future uh, needs, not unmet needs today. Well, that's what you were asking, Jeff. That's what I was asking, but but I heard that it is. I mean, this is you know if the if the um, if the if the chief were to okay. say I want to be fully funded, that's what it's going to take. That's right. Yeah. Reserve to be funded. If you were to replace all the, I mean. First of all, let's, let's stop for a moment and say, how is our equipment in the city today? As Stuart pointed out, in fire, which has the biggest unfunded, we just bought a new, new truck company. I mean, it's, it's brand new. And we have fairly modern equipment that is in good shape, I think you would say, for the most part, in, the, in, in all our departments. I mean, there's some, some that are better than others, but it's in pretty decent shape. We're not, we're not facing any deficit in current operations. But if you were to, to fund the replacement of all the vehicles that we have now on the schedule that, you know, in the recommended schedule, that's the amount you would need. And so I, I don't want to exaggerate the level of the need. It isn't like tomorrow we're suddenly going to stop having good equipment. So, so, the, so the fire truck that you just used as the example, right. okay, pretty new fire truck, it's, it's <coughs> Is it in this list of unfunded, but it's out there several years? Sure. Yes, exactly. It's out there a number of years. It, someday it will have to be replaced. And so theoretically, you're putting money aside every year to replace that new truck, right? But it, it isn't going to be replaced for X number of years down the road. And um, uh, 
and i mean it's not uncommon for cities to or organizations to adjust their replacement schedule if you know depending on a number of factors uh, usage of course would be one of them fund for depreciation yeah yeah and 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 I, the chief i will let the chiefs better describe their sense of the condition of their equipment and what's happening okay. but i i don't want to leave the impression that oh my gosh we have a catastrophe this year in terms of rolling stock because i don't believe that to be true i mean we, it's the problem is that it's real but it's out there and and at a first glance of that chart that's what it tells me yeah. is, it, is that we have a a major underfunding within the equipment of the fire department which we do for future replacement that is a true statement future replacement when you're asking you're going to have to buy another fire truck i will let john explain to you the nature and the extent of it he can do a better job than i can floyd 10 years 15 years 20. I, again, I would defer to, to, to John on what, where he sees the problems coming. Well, say hypothetically it's 10 years. Mm -hmm. okay. we, we, we need to fund right. a tenth of this big red. Well, it's one of, the reasons, one of the reasons why we're proposing to put uh, some money back into the equipment of replacement this year to make up for what we haven't been putting in. We actually robbed it a couple of years ago, so we're proposing to put money back into it this year. We actually originally, oh. in 2002, though, is when we first went out for the levy, that included 200000 a year to go into equipment replacement, you know, for the fire department. And then when we renewed it, we, you know, the renewal, the four years later, was still to include it. But then after the 2012 um, levy renewal, um, then we increased it because of compression just did not have those funds to be able to put into equipment replacement but we were able to keep up with it for many years but now because of compression we haven't been able to it's been a challenge yeah Fine. yeah going back to the three hundred thousand we took a couple of years ago uh, we we took that three hundred thousand to balance the general fund did we take it just out of the general fund equipment replacement component or did you take it across the board on all of them? Across the board on all of them. And are you re Same way. So when we comes time to replace a bus or a backhoe, they're not going to be short? No. Because you borrowed the money and gave it to the general fund? No. Okay. No, it would be a reversal of that journal entry. With interest? With interest. Yeah. Mark raised that same question, oddly enough. <laughs> Public works guys think a lot alike. <laughs> well, you can see the general fund didn't have money to loan in the equipment replacement. So you're right in describing that public works provided the lion's share of that loan. So it's also appropriate that it be reimbursed uh, that cost. And it, it's, a, it's a finance financing issue that you remind me of every year. There's a difference between a transfer and a loan. A very important difference. <laughs> the loan ha has to be repaid by within the same fiscal year. Yes, unless it's for capital. Capital purchase can be over ten years, but uh, for op an operational purpose within a year, within the same budget year. Yeah. Can I presume that any of these unfunded uh, uh, reserves also are factoring in inflation? Do do we set up equipment replacement? Do we pay into the reserve for the equipment that the um, fire districts provide to us. Yes. When they buy us an engine, do we assume that we have to pay for the replacement of that? Or are we assuming that 10 years down the road or 15, they're going to give us another one? Chief is nodding yes. Sorry? The chief is nodding yes. Okay, so about the inflation question, um, Ray. Yeah, and I'd have to confirm on our spreadsheet. I would, um, we bring it current to a 1231 number, so I'm not sure if those future values, uh, I'd have to check the formula in the spreadsheet to see if they're discounted back to a, an, 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 a present value that would include that future cost. Yeah. But they are, I think, given what the chief just told you that we're using pretty conservative assumptions when we create the formula for the, the contribution to the fund Sorry. no helpful okay 
Um, one more area that I want to just address two slides quickly, and that has to do with total personnel costs. So I mentioned equipment replacement and the second total personnel costs. And this is looking, uh, as was the equipment replacement, a citywide look. And a couple things I want to point out in this chart, uh, the two major uh, components of the of personnel costs are wages and salaries and employer paid benefits. Also included in this chart are unemployment, temporary wages, and overtime. But those are very small at the top end of the, of the table, as you can see, over the bars. A um, uh, second point I wanted to emphasize is this is comparing. Sorry. <laughs> I wondered where that was coming from. <laughs> Three years of actual costs, and then the current year estimate uh, where we'll end up June 30th, and then the proposed budget. And consistent with our financial policies, we overstate expenditures and understate revenues so that we have a year-end balance that we can anticipate or that we can count on having as a beginning balance and an available revenue in the next year. But excuse me, in the next year's budget. So really the difference uh, where we see a very uh, consistent total for 2011, 12, and 13, and then the increases in 14 and 15, really the increases in 14, 15 are that difference in budgeting, the difference between budget and actual. It is very much a hold the line budget. And as those numbers reflect actuals, the difference will be what we're carrying forward as a beginning balance in the next year budget. Uh, that's been consistent. It's what leads us or enables us to be able to receive the uh, recognition that we have for maintaining our, uh, our ratings and uh, good audit reports, is that financial practices, we anticipate those costs and we apply them. So I wanted to point out in just a little bit more detail uh, the employer paid benefits and uh, showing two of the largest uh, components of employer paid benefits being PERS and health insurance. And you can see those changes have uh, been consistent with what we have described in the cost of health insurance. In 2012, we modified the insurance plan and were able to see some savings in that year from the prior year. Uh, there's been continued growth in health insurance, and as Wes alluded to, we're looking again at changes in health insurance plan and seeing if there's opportunity for savings in restructuring our health insurance plan. Uh, the PERS costs, we're not, very, we're not able to influence very much. Uh, they kind of tell us what our rate is. And again, the increases that are shown there, again, largely reflect the difference between a budget and an actual. And at the time we prepared the budget, as was the case in the current year budget, uh, we estimated a certain uh, rate that we would be paying for PERS, and then the state legislature implemented some savings. Uh, we didn't adjust the budget, and those savings then contribute to our year-end balance and uh, resources available in each department. And I still feel that's a, a prudent strategy to take in, in our budgeting process. And so in the current year, we uh, estimated 11% uh, increases in health insurance. When our actual premiums came, they're a little bit less than that. And so that gives us a little bit of room in our line item budgets. And not a great deal of room, but a little bit of room. Uh, we'll have, I'll ask uh, David uh, to confirm exactly what those percents were in discussions of premiums. Uh, we budget 11%. Uh, I'm trying to, I could, uh, Um, Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is the fire department, fire union employees participate in that health plan. The actual increase was 8 percent, 8.04 percent. Uh, Pacific Source and Moda health plans, the actual increase was 6 percent. So that one came in uh, better than we had anticipated. And again, those estimates are made early in the year, and we don't know what our experience will be on actual claims and what those we still have another quarter to go through before we're able to get firm estimates on those, uh, on those numbers. So those are some general parameters, some of the into the weeds a little bit. Uh, hopefully that's helpful to describe some of the thought process and some of the parameters that were looked at in uh, putting together the proposed budget. And if there are no other questions, I think Mark is very anxious to get started on his presentation. Can, can, I, ask just, bit back can I ask one real quick question? At least I hope it's a quick question. You would mentioned earlier that there was money from the Pepsi fund going into the general fund, being transferred into the general fund. Did I understand that right? 
That's the the course, transfer right. from the Pepsi settlement proceeds is to equipment replacement. To equipment mm -hmm. replacement. Yeah, okay. the in lieu of franchise fee from the street fund is to the general fund. Okay. You assume that Pepsi fund transfer is going to be an annual thing? I would hope not. Um, well, let's see. Well, we're hoping not, but as you as shown, and with the growth we're anticipating, and if we don't have more HP decisions, you know, we'll have more resources in the general fund, and hopefully we'll be able to fund equipment replacement going forward. But that's become one of the first places that gets reduced in order to balance the budget. So either that or the next pro probable scenario would be we would identify equipment and ask the voters if they would fund a bond levy for in support of um, specified equipment. So would that kind of a bond levy um, be immune from the um, urban renewal rules? It would be apart from it would be a city issue. Mm. Um, and with our uh, charter amendments, uh, any debt that the city would intend to pursue, we would approach through a general obligation bond. Uh, because we're going to the voters anyway, and it's the cheapest, <laughs> uh, cheapest debt that we can incur. So that would be our, that would be the approach. If we come to that point, uh, we would be meeting and discussing with budget committee probably early on, and then with city council uh, uh, subsequent to that on what the package would look like and how it could be presented to voters. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. big binders. Good evening. Good evening. Mark Shepard. I'm the director of the Community Development Department and the Public Works Department. And uh, if the chair and the budget committee would allow me, I'd like to start with the Community Development Department budget um, because some of these changes with the uh, the melding of the two departments, if I can explain what's happening in community development, I think it makes it a little clearer when we get to the public works budget. So uh, if that's okay. okay. So my plan tonight in my presentation is to give you an overview of each of the departments. Uh, what we do in those departments, how we do it, uh, changes that have been made in the recent past in response to the economic issues that the city is facing, uh, then give you an overview of what's happening department-wide as far as uh, uh, organizational changes that are being proposed, and then to dive into the book um, and I'll let you drive on that. I, my thought is I will go section by section, but you can stop me at any time to ask me a question about any program, about any line item, and I will do my best to answer that question. Before I begin, I do want to thank uh, most of the staff back there, our community development, uh, and even more our public works staff, and those are the staff that know the details of the budget, that put this budget together, that have struggled with competing interests and needs, and have uh, developed this budget for you. They've done a lot of work, and uh, hopefully they're able to answer detailed questions that you might have that I'm not able to answer. So the Community Development Department has been through a lot of change and a lot of stress in recent years. Um, most recently they've had to learn to deal with me as a director. <laughs> and they've done so very professionally and patiently and I appreciate that. Uh, the 
building department just a few years ago was on the verge of being insolvent and being shut down and the general fund actually came in and helped fund and keep the building department going. Uh, we've cut a lot of positions and I'm going to get into that. The planning department has been operating uh, with sig significantly fewer staff and specifically this year as I, as I took over the department, I wanted to take some time to really assess the needs and so some positions were left open and they've been continuing to function very professionally and I very much appreciate that. On top of uh, development increasing, which both building and, and planning have to address, there have been some special projects that the planning department has dealt with. The new uh, community development block grant program, CDBG program, came online for us a uh, little over a year ago, or a little less than a year ago. And that's been a great effort to try to bring that program up to speed. Uh, we have a community development commission now to deal with uh, uh, and to help us make those decisions. We also have the business ready task force that came and we had to manage that. Some code changes to try to make Albany a little more business friendly regarding how our development code is and remove some barriers. So um, a lot of stress for that for the community development department uh, and they've done a great job. So community development really has two work groups in it, building and planning. Planning as what probably comes to mind for most of you is they're dealing with land use and uh, development proposals that come into them and also long range planning for what's the city going to look like. But there are other issues they deal with that you may not think about. Floodplain management, historic preservation, code enforcement, and then the CDBG program. Uh, that I spoke about. They have a customer service counter that's open every business day, 8 to 5. We don't have staff just set aside to deal with customers. The planners come up, they take turns, they deal with customers' questions, they get back to their work. Uh, and they do that 8 to 5 and they cover for each other over when they have sicknesses and vacations. We had 47 land use applications approved last year. Now we had more that came in the door and maybe didn't uh, see fruition, but 47 that came through the entire process. Some of those are dealt at a staff level, others go to the planning commission, others go to the planning commission, and then the city council. Um, so those land use decisions can be very time consuming and complex. We had 46 pre-application meetings with developers. Those are free to developers. And we, we provide those with community development staff, uh, which includes planners, uh, building inspectors, the fire department, public works staff, giving developers an idea of what they might be up against with a project and trying to look for solutions so they understand what's needed to be successful with their development before they go out and spend a lot of money. We have four subdivision applications that have come in. This is residential subdivisions since January. It's significant because last year, all of the calendar year, we had one. So I think that's a good sign that development is picking up. And, uh, and that development is going to, in turn, hopefully bring up our taxes and help the general fund. Um, we also, as I spoke about, we developed the CDBG program. That's federal money that comes in and is allotted to low and middle income uh, households, both for housing and also um, business opportunities, and the Business Ready Task Force in which we tried to eliminate some of the uh, barriers to economic development in our community. The building department, obviously you think of plan reviews uh, as they come in, whether it's residential, commercial, industrial, you think of the inspections, but you may not think of the ADA compliance inspections uh, that they do and working with customers to make sure they're compliant. The building department does erosion prevention and sediment control inspections on behalf of the public works department. They do code enforcement. Uh, that is a significant role for them. And in fact, the building department does get a little bit of general fund to offset some of the, the work they do uh, for non-building code enforcement work. 
And then they're also on hand for emergency response. Should we have an earthquake, our building inspectors would go out and do evaluations of our buildings to see are they safe to enter. Uh, so there's a lot that goes on there. Building also staffs the customer service counter every business day. This past year, they issued over 3,000 permits, performed 9,000 inspections, and the total value of all private construction that they permitted last year was $65 million. So how do we do it? In planning, we have, uh, we're proposing in the fiscal year 2015 budget a staff of 6.1 FTE. We need to do our land use reviews within 120 days, so we have state mandated uh, deadlines that we have to meet, and that can be tight if you have to go through public hearings. We deal with the Planning Commission, a Landmarks Advisory Commission that helps us with uh, Historic Preservation, and the Community Development Commission, which works on the CDBG funding. In building, proposing a staff of 6.5 FTE, they are required to do, or they do inspections within 24 hours or less. When the call comes into the hotline, they get out and get those things inspected within 24 hours, usually quicker than that. They do have a requirement for all residential permits that those are turned around within 10 business days. And they are, the building department is self-supported by revenues they generate through permit fees with the exception of a small transfer, $35,000 transfer from the general fund uh, in recognition of code enforcement work that's outside of building issues. Some of the history, and I touched on this at the beginning. Since 2010, planning staff has been reduced by 3.1 FTE. Building staff since 2008 has been reduced by 8 FTE. Uh, in this, this calendar, or this fiscal year, as I said, we've delayed uh, filling the planning manager position. I'm actually going through the recruitment now uh, for that position. We held another position open for the entire fiscal year. We're reclassifying that position. But the staff has worked uh, very professionally uh, on, uh, in, again, a very stressed situation. The building department does use contract staff for specialty inspections for certifications that they don't hold. I believe it's commercial plumbing. That contract staff can also fill in should we have extended illness or vacations that need coverage. So rather than staffing up for um, those needs, we can meet those needs through contract. Here's a graph that shows actual personnel Cost. This is not total budget. This is just the personnel expenditures for the planning department from fiscal year 0809 through fiscal year 1213. That's the last year that I have full data. So you can see the downward trend here. Here's the same information for the building department from 0809 to 1213. So the proposed budget summary of what's happening. Significant I'm proposing some significant organizational changes. The consolidation of the director position for both community development and public works, which we've been operating under for pretty much this entire fiscal year. I'm also proposing to consolidate administrative services with public works uh, administrative staff. So an overall reduction of 2.15 FTE. Two of those FTE, though, they're not being laid off. They're being moved from the planning budget, which is a general fund budget, to the public works administration budget. And we'll get into that in public works. We are proposing to eliminate a three-quarter time ADA coordinator position. That position is vacant right now. And those duties will be assumed by building staff for ADA issues on private property and by public works engineering staff for ADA issues that, hap that uh, we need to address in the public right-of-way. So eliminating that and absorbing that in, in staff. And then proposing to add a 0.6 FTE for CDBG program administration. That position being funded entirely through CDBG proceeds. The money that the city gets, uh, there's a percentage that we're allowed to use for administration of the program. 
The rest of that money goes out into activities in the community. And the proposed budget, as we get into it, you'll see the that FTE is funded entirely by the proceeds of the CDBG money rather than general fund. So these changes would reduce planning personnel costs by about $190,000 this uh, coming fiscal year. The overall planning budget is reduced by about $140,000. And then we have the new CDBG budgets added. We'll, I'll show you those again. Administration and activities completely supported by that outside funding. The building department has a small reduction of about $20,000. Uh, I am happy to say that because of the building activity in Albany, the building department has been able to uh, develop an operating reserve. Uh, right now, we're pr we have a projection of about $400,000. It's likely going to be quite a bit higher than that. Could be up upwards of $600,000 um, if the permit revenue continues for these last two months. That operating reserve uh, will help us should building um, activity drop to help us bridge that gap. Those are funds that uh, have to be set aside and cannot be commingled with the general fund. So if there aren't any questions, well, first of all, are there questions about the big picture before we open the book and start looking at, at budget pages? Okay. I'm going to pass out, um, as if you don't have enough paper, if I may, I'll keep one. organizational chart. Thank you, sir. And that's for you to refer to. Uh, maybe you'll have questions. But it, this organizational chart you'll see on the top is the current organization. On the bottom is the proposed organization in the 2015 budget. So that gives you the, the big picture for community development. OK, with that. Um, We'll start looking at budget pages, and uh, please feel free to stop me uh, if you have any specific questions. I'm going to, my thought is to, to go over uh, my fund or program here uh, and kind of stay at a, at a high elevation, but I'm happy to, to answer questions you might have on specifics. So the community development budget starts on page 217 where we have themes and goals. You have the planning budget on page 218 and 219. The main item to note here is the two FTE uh, that we're reducing in, that, in the planning uh, budget, and those are moving into Public Works Administration. And then you'll also see, as Stuart had mentioned, Public Works Administration is then going to charge back to planning for the administration portion. And Public Works already does this uh, in our own funds. And now that there's um, the melding of the two departments, you'll see on page 219, line item 66017, that's a Public Works Administration charge. So that's what planning is getting charged for the director position and these two administration uh, positions. Any questions on planning? OK, next is building. And the building funds are page 220 through 226. You'll note there's two building uh, funds there. You have building inspection and then electrical permit uh, programs. Those are separated because the state requires that, that the electrical permit revenue and programs are separate from the other building uh, permit revenues and programs. So you, you have two separate building inspection programs there. You'll see similar to planning that there are public works administration chargebacks on page 222, again, line 66017. And on page 224 for electrical is 66017. The ADA code enforcement budget. So, um, Mark. Yes. On, um, for central services then under building inspection, 
and since our revenues are up, um, and if you go back to the 2011, 2012, um, we had 44,000, but we're actually really charging a lot lower, projecting for 16,900. And I know there's a formula for that. Um, it's is there a reason? That's a Stuart Stuart question. Yeah. Good question, Mayor. On the quick look, my my uh, uh, answer would be it's due to the reduced FTE. As I mentioned, the full-time equivalent number of positions is a key component mm. uh, in both the human resources charges and the overall central service charge. So probably with the re right now, I'd say it's largely due to the reduction of the full-time equivalents in building. Okay. All right. Thank you. And Mark, on the top of that page, four three zero zero five. The charges for services went up 168 percent. What is that? I'm sorry, which page? Uh, 221. On the top it says 43005. I believe those are Actually, I'm going to have to ask Gary to remind me if those, those, well, actually, I believe those are for our erosion prevention and sediment control charges. That's where the building department is doing the work for public works in those inspections. The reason it's going up is previously we only charged the actual salary rate. Now we are charging the full, what we call a full burden rate. So there's administrative, you know, there's a burden on top of it. So it's not that there's, well, there is some additional work because building is picking up, but the big jump is based on it being a fully burdened rate rather than just making up some salary. I know that uh, the folks here are dealing with constant code revision, constant changes in re regulations. Where in here do you have training? I don't. I have only seen one line item for education and training, and that's the CD uh, BG fund. I don't see it anywhere else in here. Would you let there, me know where that is? So it's line six one zero one one. Six and you'll, one. Under materials and services, and you'll okay. you'll see that's that. That's the one I'm looking for. Through the different budgets, and then you also have. Um, meetings and conferences, so sometimes they'll go to a conference to get their training, okay. and that's 61026. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mark? Um, information Technology Services and Building Inspection, um, are we completely integrated now, or do we still have further distance to go to do planning, building inspection, everything all together um, via computer? You, the building department has implemented the, the e-plans system, and we've actually had uh, submittals brought in. Um, I guess I'll ask Gary. I know we've had a few hiccups. We're getting there, uh, and we can now take those plans. Um, and Gary, I don't know if you can give some information about if you want to come up and Gary can let you know what the the ramp up and and where we're at with the details. So we obviously are going through some uh, large changes for everybody, for us and the uh, applicants that are coming in. So uh, about the last month, we've actually been full steam ahead on it. So most of our plans are. Uh, both residential and commercial are coming in uh, electronically. We are taking one roll of plans just in case, so yeah. you know, the, as a backup. And I'm actually using those today on two two different commercial projects that I'm working on. So, uh, but yeah, uh, we're learning, and the staff is learning, and the, uh, the the applicants are learning. So it's a it's a good process, and been been quite a leap, but it's been taking a long time to do it. But I think we're getting closer. So. Right. Are, are we are we at a point? Are we going to need to purchase more equipment, um, more different not programs that I, not that I know of, I uh, think for you, either yeah. you or planning? Uh, well, actually, we have uh, pretty much so planning and public works and building and fire. Everybody's all done at the same time. 
So everybody does concurrent reviews electronically on that. So uh, yeah. I think Public Works is doing their SI permits uh, also, which is a kind of a standalone. Now I'm not sure about planning is somewhere Plan in the mix too. But right. Planning has not yet implemented it. We've been kind of stepping it up. Uh, and planning will probably be the last to implement on the land use side. But we are, we are moving forward, and, and it's been with positive results. That was the hope. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. And that, that is a good point. The e-plans the e is one of those efficiencies that we've looked for, and, and our thought is, even as things ramp up, if we're able to do these reviews electronically, we won't have to immediately staff up uh, to meet that increased demand. So. The last um, budget in uh, the building section is the ADA code enforcement. And as I said, we're, we're proposing to eliminate the, the position there, the three-quarter time position. We do have a little bit of money here in case we need any specialized help. So we haven't closed that budget out. So you see a little bit of, of uh, a small budget there. Um, just as we warm up to taking care of that ADA stuff through building staff uh, and public works staff. Mark, so, um, and I know we've kind of always had this program as sort of a placeholder, so it doesn't really put our community as being, you know, subjected to, as Wes has said, kind of lawsuits if we're not end up, you know, if we're not really being a little bit more proactive in, um, you know, disability um, access. So are we, do we have somewhere else then in the budget that we're going to be at least addressing that, that we will always be looking at um, ADA accessibility? Yeah, we have, as we get into public works, we have some, some actual capital funds that we put aside each year to address ADA. And we will still be addressing ADA. We just won't have a, actually the new ADA coordinator is me. That's my, that's my. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess what I'm saying is. So, but, but in reality, my coordination will be asking Gary and his staff to take care of things on private property and asking Jeff Blaine and his staff to take th care of things on, uh, in the public right of way. So we are not, the program is not going away. We are just dealing with it with uh, our existing staff and eliminating that position. Keeping this program narrative always in our budget then as going forward so it always looks like we're being kind of proactive in ADA. We, we certainly could do that if that's uh, what, what is the preference. <coughs> I'd just like to add too that I think that the CDBG program actually gave us an opportunity to add some resources into mm -hmm. ADA compliance and uh, I think we should take note of that. You might also notice that uh, David Shaw is missing tonight and so our new HR director will also be Mark. Uh, <laughs> Mark. That's why I'm wearing a suit. <laughs> I noticed on page 226 on the ADA code enforcement again, the central service charges of $3,800, the relationship between that and the total amount of the uh, budgeting seems is that going to go drop off dramatically then in, in future years because of the, basically you're effectively getting rid of the program per se? Or is it? Um, I, I'll let Stuart, I believe so. I th essentially the central service charges I think kind of lag a year because they have to build it on something. Uh, am I correct, Stuart? Yeah, that's exactly right. Thank yeah. you. Mark, on the um, op operating reserve in the building inspection, um, so that's a new thing, and I understand why you guys would want that. Do you have a target of what, what you'd like to see that grow to? It depends on who you ask. If you ask Gary, he'd like about two years' worth of <laughs> operating reserve. Well, to give you a – we are – Gary and I are actually talking about that and, and trying to figure out what is a good reserve number. It takes a little under $100,000 a month to run the building department. So. If you have $600,000 in there, you have a six-month reserve if you're going to spend that all down. So um, I think what you'll see as we look at it here in the next year, um, we'll be coming up with some targets. Now, I know that the city's general uh, um, 
policy is a minimum of 5%. Uh, this will exceed that. So I do, to answer your question, no, there is not, I do not have an established target right now. Now, one of the issues will be if, let's say we're, we are very successful with e-plans, we're able to process a whole lot of more permitting without adding staff, that reserve likely will grow as a result of it. And we wouldn't be looking to hire people just so we don't have a larger reserve. What could be looked at then would be permit fees or something like that. I'm not advocating for that tonight. But Mark, aren't most permit fees in building and building in electrical set by state? They have to be approved by state. Uh, I'm not sure if they would have an issue with us reducing fees. <laughs> be a nice headline. <coughs> Did you want to say something, Wes? Yeah, I, 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 in response to the question of how much reserves is enough, back in the glory days, uh, some of our building types in the city made a big deal that we had accumulated about an $800,000 reserve in the building fund. And that man we managed to get rid of that in a couple of years. Um, uh, and so, and, and took it to a point where uh, within the last two years, Gary was coming to me with stating he was really nervous because we had a, we had a particularly bad month and he wasn't sure he was going to have enough money to sustain operations into the year. Well, you know, and this, it's, a, it's a really good illustration about, you know, you just can't control all the variables. So you, you, you try and plan for the worst, and I think we've done a reasonably good job of doing that, and for seeing reasonable possibilities. But I don't think any of us saw how quickly the building fund would recover. Uh, going from last fall, because I, I guess it was last fall, wasn't it, that, that Gary was expressing his concerns, to now having a, uh, a reserve of, uh, the last time I looked, it was 680000 and I'm guessing by the end of the year it could easily, because usually May and June are very positive months for the building department, uh, so it could easily be even as high as 800000 one additional item I observed is the revenue generally comes in at the time the permit is issued. Yeah. The inspections can occur up to a year later, and that infusion of revenue has to carry that expense for the full year. Yeah, good point. Bill? Back to the uh, <coughs> ADA uh, section, code enforcement. I believe there's a project out for bid now that has to do with improving some of the transit transient bus uh, stops Yep. and I would guess there's maybe some ADA improvements or requirements built into that project. That's correct and in fact uh, a lot of our, well all of our street projects we do build in addressing ADA issues if we have right. missing curb ramps or curb ramps that aren't compliant we replace them at that time. So. Our ADA investment isn't all necessarily in one pot. In fact, it, it's spread out between, uh, it's in the street fund, it's in the ADA capital budget that, sh that we'll talk about with public works. Right. Uh, and this really here is, is you know, uh, kind of administrating the, the program. Um, we do need to develop a, what's called an ADA transition plan that identifies what are all our deficiencies and what are our priorities on how we will start addressing those deficiencies. So that'll be a, a project for this year to get that uh, completed. And I think Sharon's point is well taken. Uh, Wes has told us about what happened over in Bend. I, I just don't think we want people to get the impression that the program's going away or, or we're not doing anything because that's not the case. And I think, in fact, if the programs were detailed and a list compiled, people would be surprised to how much work in that area is done on an annual basis. It just kind of shows up. I mean, here's a new wheelchair ramp at, at a corner that, that wasn't there before. Right, and the Parks Department is also making investments as they do park rehabilitation, uh, not only on their, their trails, but on their uh, parks equipment and playground equipment. So uh, there is investment across the entire city. 
Colleen? Uh, yes, on page 227, this uh, CDBG grant of 389000 plus, will that arrive in July, or do you know when you will receive that? So we have two years of funding for CDBG um, <coughs> that, that you'll see here in the, this grant funding. Mm -hmm. So pages 228 and 229 is the fiscal year 2013-14 funds that we received. Now we received those and it took, it took us a while to get the whole program up and running and identify what, what are we going to spend that money on. So you'll see th this is a carryover of 2013-14 money. Then if you flip over to pages 232 and 233, that's the money we're anticipating getting in, to, uh, in fiscal year 1415 in the, in the budget year we're talking about tonight. Okay. And, and you have the administration side and the activity side. And these activities go through the Community Development Commission. Ultimately, a recommendation is made to council and then council authorizes the expenditure and contracts for these these expenses but you don't know what month you'll receive that or um, I don't know I think the 2013 14 funds are available now yeah. mm -hmm. um, and I don't recall when the 14 15 funds are going to be available thank you and correct me if I'm wrong uh, when the funding does come in there has to be a, a, a a hefty amount of it actually, in fact, spent or could jeopardize future funding? That's correct. Um, moving forward, you're only allowed to carry over half a year's worth of funding. Obviously, we're doing more than that here in this first year, but you know, we didn't get notice until I think it was May or June of, of last year, and so we really haven't had an opportunity to get the program up and running. So uh, the other uh, grant, grant funding you see there is the State Historic Preservation Grants on page 230 and Housing Fund Grants on page 231. The uh, grants on page 230 are uh, passed through from the state for uh, registered historic homes. People can apply for those grants and the Landmarks Advisory Commission evaluates those applications and the, the grants are, are given. And then the housing grants on page 231, that is money that the city has received back as loan payments from previous CDBG loans and now can be used uh, as loans or grants on further housing projects. So, so Mark, though, we're, for that fund, though, that's where we have the loan with helping hands of that 150 out of this fund. In the housing so, fund? Yeah, so we're not having any reference to that in this budget. Because that I was told today um, that it looks like within probably a week we have that loan paid for. We're going to be having to adjust the timing because we put April 30th, but they just received check the check today. So... Um, so that'll be on the plate. But we're going to have to have reference to that as coming back into this fund then. Um, so it might be, might be something when it comes back to the final document when it gets submitted to have some sort of wording in there that there is that outstanding loan. We, we can be very accommodating to receiving unanticipated revenues. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I'm not... Mm -hmm. Stuart, would that revenue then be new revenue or is that accounted for in our... I don't know how that accounting is done. Yeah, it would be new revenue in the housing okay. fund. Okay. And to address what the mayor is describing, you'll notice throughout the budget, and she's like identified a, a formatting in the budget. When this, when this <coughs> line item, or when this program was a line item in the general fund, it, did, it was included in the narrative. And throughout the budget, we don't have narrative pages for grants. So we'll identify a way to accommodate what you're describing so that we make sure we keep that record of this of the activity for this particular grant and program. So once the money comes back in from loan repayments, do we recycle it back based back on the original uh, qualifying expense or does that become fungible money? 
It, I think it, believe it has to be used for housing unless we get some sort of approval from the state. And usually it's targeted, my understanding is, and I don't have a lot of history with it, it's targeted to low and moderate income. Mm -hmm. it, it's, sort of, I think it's, sort, it's sort of fungible. <laughs> That's probably not very precise, but the point is, is that you can, you don't, ha it, it doesn't have to be used in exactly the same way that you used it when you made the loans. Usually it's money that's repaid for improvements to low-income homes, okay, or people that lived in homes that had low incomes. And, but there's an, a range of approved projects under the CDBG umbrella that it can be used for. So it's, it's, it's not that specific, I guess. Yeah, one of the things I was used to seeing CDBG money used for a couple of decades ago was uh, in areas where there is a low income district, you could be using it for infrastructure projects that over has an overall improvement to the entire district. So in some cases where our in lieu of franchise fees, we might have been targeting some maintenance and streets. If that money becomes fungible, we can still put it in that low income area. Yeah. I mean my understanding with Ann is she researched it and so when we actually gave this loan out of this fund, it that you know we really it needed to make sure it went back into this fund so I know Ann has researched it so we need to make sure we're going to be complying with those yeah. mm -hmm. I would I would think this the actual new CDBG funding again I, I don't know and, and we really should talk to Ann that might be a more likely place to find funds for capital type improvements because the CDBG is going to fund uh, some curb ramp replacements um, I think $29,000 in uh, this fiscal year was set aside and there'll be some more money in next. So there must be some ability to use that for some sort of public capital improvement. But, uh, yeah. So that's it for all of community development unless there's further questions. Are you ready to start on public work? Somebody need a quick break, or should we just? I'm just warming up. <laughs> it's warm enough in here. I always enjoy when these wrap up around nine o'clock, but. Um, Second. Favor. <laughs> I hate. I don't. We don't want to rush through. It's a large section. It, it is your meetings. All right. Thank you, Mark. We'll move on to our last agenda items here. Okay. And we'll Are you going to start color coding your hats? Excuse me? <laughs> Are you going to start color coding your hats so we know which one you Yes, I'll, I'll try to do that. Yeah, do you plan to be done before 10? <laughs> yeah. I think so. Yeah, we are. I'd like to get something to eat before I go to bed. Yeah, no, we are. We're we're stopping with with Mark, and um, on our agenda, we have time for any budget committee discussion. You might want to talk about something that we want to have happen before our next meeting, or something about how we're doing the rest of the meetings. Um, any discussion there? Dick. Yeah. I've got a question. It's back many years ago before you were here, but we had a period of rapid residential construction. And I remember it, money coming in, but it's also, at that time, it was described as sort of residential takes a lot of services. And it takes, it really, we made money on, or realized a profit, whatever you want to say, on commer industrial fill out. But residential, we're, we're talking about bringing money in, but it, you know, there was a time when it didn't work that way because it required so many services. I don't, Dick, I, think, I don't think that's changed. Um, there is, there's a, some lag time there, and of course the other thing is, is that residential does drive commercial, and maybe... Well, I realize it's good but yeah well I mean it's a, it is a mixed bag and you know you, you but and, and it's a it's a valid point that uh, uh, you know 
really rapid growth probably brings creates as many new expenses as the as as it, as it does revenue. So, but I, I think what we're seeing is not, you know, we're not seeing that really rapid expansion. It's, mm -hmm. But it's it, we're certainly doing better than we have been. I'm just concerned when we see it as a, a, a boost to income. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a fair concern. I just want to remind you that after the May 13th meeting, I will not be attending the meeting. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Scott. Being that I drew this seat right here and that screen's behind me, I would love to have a copy of the slides before the meetings. Uh, the two up format is excellent. I would love to maintain eye contact with the speaker and look at the slides in front of me instead of constantly moving out of the way. Um, plus, I think they're a great reference point in preparation for the meeting as well as follow-up for the meeting. So um, I'd be happy to print them out myself. I don't know if you want to send them out as PDFs to the group or print them to be sensitive to cost, but I think they'd be very helpful. I think PDFs would be the most efficient. Yeah, PDFs with two per page. Because then we sure. can, including the ones from this evening. I, I know Stuart can do that. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so as, <laughs> as far as order at the, um, the May 13th meeting, so we'll have um, public works. I understand that Ed would like to do the library section at the next meeting. Um, are we following the book, the order in the book then of the tabs so people can be prepared? Okay. All right. Any other business? All right. Uh, this meeting is continued to May 13th, 2014. That went well.